COVID-19. This event is jointly organized by Bragg Institute of Governance and of Development and the Rule of Law Program, GIZ Bangladesh. The research has been supported by German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. This is a significant piece of research reflecting the urgency of time. Germany, for its part, has been proud to support this work in a year where it celebrates 50 years of partnership with Bangladesh. We are honored to have with us as our chief guest, Mr. Mohammad Golam Sarwar, Honorable Secretary, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs. As special guests, we have with us Ms. Umme Kulsum, Joint Secretary, Opinion, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, and National Project Director, GIZ Project. Mr. Javed Patel, Deputy High Commissioner, British High Commission, Dhaka. Ms. Karen Bloom, Deputy Head of Development Cooperation, German Embassy. And Dr. Angelika Flederman, Country Director, GIZ Bangladesh. As panelists, we are pleased to have Mr. M. M. Mahmudullah, Additional Director, Social Safety Net Wing, Department of Social Services. Ms. Chima Muslim, Joint General Secretary, Bangladesh Mohila Parishad. Dr. Shafiqul Islam, former Director, Education BRAC. And Dr. Zinia Afroz, Clarissa, Country Coordinator, Ter Des Om. We request our esteemed guests to rem remain seated. We will call you to the stage for the relevant sessions as an identified in the schedule. The event will be moderated by Dr. Imran Mateen, Executive Director, BRAC Institute of Governance and Development. I would now request Dr. Mateen to come to the stage along with our chief guest, Mr. Mohammad Golam Sarwar, Honorable Secretary, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, and the presenters, Ms. Mahin Sultan, Ms. Lapita Haq, and Mr. Raid Arman. Um, respected guests, before we start, I would like to inform you that today's event will be live streamed through Facebook platform and guests will also be joining us through virtually via Zoom platform. For the purpose of documentation and reporting, the event will be recorded and photographs will be taken. Thank you in advance for your consent and cooperation. In adherence to COVID protocols, we request that masks are kept on and social distancing is maintained throughout the event. I would now like to request Dr. Mateen to give his welcome speech and present the objectives of the event. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief Guest of today's event, Mr. Mahmoud Kulam Sarwar, Secretary, Law and Justice Division. Uh, special guest, uh, Ms. Umme Kulsum. Special guests, Mr. Javed Patel, Karen Bloom, Dr. Angela, Ang Angelika Flederman, um, welcome and all audiences, welcome to today's dissemination event. Uh, so what I wanted to do is, so my name is Dr. Imran Mateen, I'm the Executive Director of Brack Institute of Governance and Development at Brack University. Um, and we, in partnership with GIZ, have been uh, doing this research, so uh, and we want to you know, today basically share the findings from this research. Uh, so before we get into the findings, I would just like to, you know, share with you uh, what the objectives are for sort of today's uh, event. Um, and, and the objectives are primarily, you know, to sort of firstly to disseminate our, our work, but, uh, but also to catalyze, I think, and this is really important, we really want to catalyze a, a a policy conversation 
in terms of what is to be done next. And I think that's where we should really, really focus. We should really focus on obviously interrogating the research findings, but spend much more time in terms of really focusing on uh, what next. And I, and I really hope that that's what we'll really, really focus on. And, and what from BIGD's side, what we want to take away from this is uh, obviously we want to take the inputs that will reflect in finalizing the policy brief that we have developed. But much more importantly, we want to generate ideas for more helpful research that we want to do in the future, right? So this is for us a ideas harvesting uh, uh, occasion as well. So thank you all very much in advance, uh, and I and I really hope that uh, you know we're going to get lots of very interesting uh, discussion and ideas that we can generate from here, based on which we can uh, come up with even more relevant and exciting research agenda for the future. Um, before I hand 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 over to, I mean, we'll we'll uh, there's a bit of a change because our uh, honourable chief guest, because of his uh, 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 other uh, uh, appointments, uh, uh, need to uh, leave us sooner. So he's going to be presenting uh, his his speeches after uh, mine, and then and then we'll basically move on to the presentation of the research. But before I do that, just to sort of frame minds, uh, I just want to basically. Uh, uh, you know, kind of provide a bit of a framework. We'll get to details of that in a presentation. So this research, as you can see, is focused on adolescent girls. And I think the adolescent group generally have not been uh, uh, the big attention during the COVID period. So I think that's itself important. But the whole uh, the framework here is that adolescent transition, there are certain types of adolescent transitions which are healthy and some are not, you know, and if they're not, if they're disrupted by different shocks, those transitions can actually be sources of vulnerabilities, right? So there's a whole adolescent uh, transition literature where we talk about different types of transition, right? Transition to work, transition to school, tra the psychosocial transition, uh, uh, physical health related transition and transition to active and healthy citizenry. Right? So there are these four or five types of domains of transition that people talk about during adolescence. And what COVID has done is primarily through two channels. One is the economic shock to the household and the school closure shock presents you know, a very, very, uh, you know, very interesting and uh, I think concerning uh, uh, sort of dynamics that may emerge in terms of the transition, uh, uh, adolescent transition and the vulnerabilities that it may cause. So what we really try to do in this research is use that framework to really understand how, these, how COVID has affected this transition and led to vulnerabilities and whether it has deepened vulnerabilities, how has it deepened vulnerabilities and what does it mean in terms of uh, policy choices and program design and so on and so forth. And, and access to law and justice is obviously a very important part of how those some of these vulnerabilities get redressed. So, so that's the overall framework that we are using uh, for, for today's discussion. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and I'm very, you know, excitedly looking forward to the presentation and to the discussion and moderating the event. So thank you all very much. And I would like to invite our chief guest, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, let me get the name, uh, Mr. Mohammed Gulam Sarwar, Secretary, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, to kindly deliver his remarks. Thank you so much. It would be better for me to participate and learn the lessons and uh, hear the all discussions. However, my colleague, Ms. Umme Kulsum Jain Sidri, will remain here and she will inform me about the discussion and I will take proper step if I have some uh, con to contribute in this matter. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable Deputy High Commissioner, His Excellency British High Commissioner, Mr. Jabed Petel, Ms. Karen Bloom, Deputy Head of Development Corporation, German Embassy in Bangladesh, Dr. Angelica Flederman, GIZ Bangladesh Country Director, 
Ms. Pramita Shan Gupta, Head of Program. Ms. Umme Kulsum, Giant City Line Justice Division. Dr. Imran Motin, Executive Director of Bragg Institute of Governance and Development. Respected panelists, researchers, representatives from the government, the development partners, civil societies, and distinguished presence. Assalamu alaikum and good morning. At the very outset, I pay my humble respect and honor to the greatest Bengali of all times, the founder of Bangladesh, our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who sacrificed his life to eliminate disparity and attain social justice and equity. With deep respect, I remember his family members who were killed on the fateful night of 15th August 1975. I deeply express my gratitude to the brave freedom fighters and 30 lakh martyrs who devoted their life for our identity and independence. I pray for their eternal peace of their departed soul. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to be among such distinguished personalities and to speak before this research dissemination event on adolescent girls, vulnerabilities and transitions in the context of COVID-19. I am honored to be a part to commemorate the 50 years anniversary of development cooperation between Bangladesh and Germany. Respected audience, COVID-19 has repeatedly disrupted lives across the globe, likely resulting in multidimensional effects on young people's well-being in short and long run this research dissemination event sheds light on women's access to justice in Bangladesh through an analysis of adolescent girls' life transition in the context of the COVID-19. The research findings demonstrate how adolescents' future paths are shaped by the close interrelationship between the productive and reproductive domains of their lives. The findings also help them better understand how the decisions about life trajectories of adolescents taken by the family as part of their livelihood strategy may be disrupted in the ways that have a negative consequence for them. Esteemed presence, in response to global and national concerns to domestic violence and sexual harassment, the government of Bangladesh under the visionary leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has undertaken significant development initiatives through various policies laws and steps. Along with the Domestic Violence Prevention and Protection Act 2010, the government has adopted National Action Plan 2013 and 2025 to prevent violence against children and women. Pertinent to mention, under the direction of Honorable Prime Minister and guidance of the Honorable Minister, Minister of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, Mr. Anisul Haq MP, Capital punishment for the offense of rape has been incorporated in the existing law. Moreover, under the active supervision of the Honorable Law Minister, in order to protect the dignity and honor of women, amendment process of the Evidence Act 1872 has been finalized by repealing the existing provisions which allow cross-examination regarding the immoral character of a rape victim. It will be shown Based to the cabinet, I mean, within a short period, within a week or two weeks. I am pleased to note that the key findings and recommendations of this study contribute to develop a better understanding towards the barriers of justice for women and children. This particular point has been also identified as a priority in the eighth five year plan of the government of Bangladesh. This study recommends creating an environment that is safe and secure for the adolescents. The Law and Justice Division, under the dynamic leadership of Honorable Law Minister Mr. Anisolok MP, is committed to creating access to justice for all, including adolescents through proactive legal assistance by the National Legal Aid and Services Organization. State-sponsored legal aid activities for the poor and disadvantaged reached at the doorsteps as the government has established district legal aid offices Upojila and Union Legal Aid Committees. Even during the COVID pandemic, legal aid was provided to 78,847 people, of which 38,539 were women. 
Both would be that in order to protect access to justice to people, including the women and children, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, virtual court system, a brainchild of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has, was introduced by promulgating the use of information technology by Courts Ordinance 2020, which was subsequently enacted as Act of Parliament. In 2020 and 2021, during two separate periods, total 3,14,482 petitions were disposed of by the virtual courts and 1,58,507 persons were enlarged on bail. The Law and Justice Division, under the active guidance of the Honorable Minister, facilitated the operation of those virtual courts, which contributed much to address the emergence issues and reduce the overcrowding in prisons. Distinguished audience, COVID-19 has provided the impetus to think about systems and policy reform with a sharper focus on recovery. We need to invest in creating the conditions that support human capability and well-being in a holistic sense across the policy areas that touch the lives of children and their families. I truly believe that the government, development partners, and the civil society will need to work together to build a more resilient, effective, and inclusive systems that are able to deliver the promise of access to justice as a fundamental human right for all children, regardless of their gender, region, and socioeconomic position. I believe that the research findings and recommendations will contribute to bringing about greater well-being in the lives of adolescents, especially girls. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu. Thank you, Honorable Secretary, for your inspiring speech. And thank you, Dr. Mateen, for laying out the objectives. I would now like to request Ms. Mahin Sultan, Senior Fellow of Practice, BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, Ms. Lapita Haq, Research Fellow, BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, and Mohammad Raid Arman, Senior Research Associate, BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, to present the research findings. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will start the presentation on our research on adolescent vulnerabilities and transition in the context of COVID-19. Um, so this was our research team. Um, we had uh, mobilized a large number of researchers from, we had a quantitative researchers from our economics growth cluster. Can you please stand up so that people can see you? And um, we have our qualitative researchers from the gender and social trans transformation cluster. It is a brilliant job. And thank you, uh, Advocate Zahirul Islam, who was our legal advisor and who helped us set up appointments with key informants and also helped us draft the report. Thank you very much. So, uh, I will start with the main objective of our research and I will um, um, spend some time on it. So the main objective of her research was to seek insights into women and adolescents access to justice by analyzing adolescents life transitions in the time of COVID-19. Now, what is different about this research is that um, most um, research on access to justice is in legalistic is done in legalistic terms or, you know, the focus is very much on the legal processing. But here we try to unpack access to justice uh, through uh, social science, uh, through social science lens. And what we tried to do was just look at the choices um, adolescents make and the, uh, and the opportunities they have that facilitates or hampers the process of claiming rights or, or justice. The context of COVID-19 also provided us with a unique opportunity to see what happens in a crisis and um, how, you know, how the systems hold up, which ones are weak and how decisions people make their decisions. So um, just to pause on, what connects access to justice to adolescent life transitions? Well, we know that um, women and girls' access to justice is, is important for their vulnerability to violence. 
And we know that adolescent and women's vulnerability to violence is strongly linked to early marriage. And lack of education and economic dependency, among other things, constrain their access to justice. At the same time, um, you know, in, in, in the context of COVID, we know that households suffered during COVID and the squeeze on their resources may have led the adolescents and their parents to take hard decisions regarding their life transitions, whether to get married, or whether to stay in school or get married or get into work, which the decisions which may or may not move push them towards greater vulnerability. For example, if you think about um, early marriage, uh, early marriage puts girls um, at a very young age into a highly unequal power relationship and uh, where they are basically the person with the least power or you know powerless and th that makes them susceptible to violence or for example the lack of education um, that means that the girl eventually is not able to take on any formal jobs um, so she is left to do menial work or manual labor, and that makes her economically dependent. And we know that how that affects access to justice. Now, even not being in school, not being able to um, socialize with other girls or boys, um, building up their confidence or, uh, or their um, negotiation skills, and that also gets affected when they are um, when they stop going to school. So constraints women face as adults um, does not suddenly emerge, but uh, they are constraints that are they're put in place during their adolescence, and they fester, and they and 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 they linger, and they make women more um, vulnerable. So our research questions are. What are the risks and vulnerabilities faced by uh, adolescent girls due to the pandemic and increased poverty? What are the choices adolescents and parents have had to make and whether these choices are pushing them towards greater vulnerability, which may have an effect on their future access to justice? And what are the support mechanisms and are they sufficient? And in all these questions, we will also look at um, the differences or the similarities in the decisions that taken or the choices made with regard to adolescent boys. So very quickly, I will go over the methodology. This was a mixed method research. Um, so using quantitative survey and a qualitative um, in-depth studies of adolescents uh, and the parents. And um, this was conducted in three districts of Bangladesh, so Kumilla, um, represents the eastern side of Bangladesh, which and also a more prosperous uh, village with lots of international migrants. Norail represents the southwest of Bangladesh, where there is traditionally a higher prevalence of early marriage. And Gaibandha represents a north of Bangladesh, which uh, represents the extreme poor, uh, extreme poor districts. And we thought that having a regional um, variation would you know, deepen our understanding of how people make decisions. Uh, our methodology um, uh, sampled two thirds, uh, sample of ad adolescents include two thirds girl and one third uh, boy ad adolescents. Um, so uh, when we did the survey, it was October 4th to 17th November of 2021. So I want to take you back to that time just to um, locate the research. So uh, that was after the second lockdown had been lifted. And the second lockdown, which was in April of 2021, it was much less severe than the first lockdown of March 2020. But people were, livelihoods were sort of picking up. Um, people were scrambling to sort of make up for all the losses they had incurred. Um, um, the schools, which had been closed for the last 18 months, had started reopening, but partially, and there was still a lot of uncertainty. So um, normal life obviously had not resumed fully. Now, um, uh, we did a survey of 2,758 households, um, 2,400 of which had uh, adolescents, uh, at least one adolescent between the age of 12 to 18. And we also did an additional survey of 358 households where they had married off adolescents in the last two years in order to ca capture married adolescents. 
And um, we, uh, out of these, uh, within these um, households of 2,758 households, we interviewed 3,139 adolescents. And as I said before, two thirds were girls and one third were boys. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the qualitative data collection, we selected um, uh, uh, urban area, uh, peri urban area, and uh, rural area in each of these districts. And we conducted in total 36 uh, in depth interviews with adolescents, uh, 24 girls, and 12 boys. Um, we conducted six FGDs with parents and 15 key, key informant interviews with district judges of the Shishu Adalot, probation officers, um, police officers, education officers, union, union portrait members and chairman, and uh, also um, secondary school headmaster and headmistresses. Um, and we made sure that in each of these areas, we interview girls who are in, still in school, uh, who have gotten married during this time, who have uh, have been doing paid work during this time, and who have dropped out and maybe maybe not married, maybe not gone into work, just dropped out of school. And in the case of boys, we thought that we would not get any uh, married boys, but actually we did get one married boy, but we didn't really sample for um, married boys. Um, yeah, so next. So, um, let me just briefly talk about the household characteristics. The average household size was 4.5, um, and each of these households ha had on average 1.1 adolescents. 37% um, of these households were below the poverty line at the time of the survey. 30% of the uh, households were female-headed, which is actually higher than the national um, um, percentage. And the average age of the household was 45 years. In terms of the adolescent characteristics, we had similar characteristics for adolescent boys and girls. They were uh, on average 14 years old, and they had, in average, uh, seven years of schooling. Um, we, uh, the percentage of married adolescents we captured in the survey was 0.79, so it was quite a small uh, sample, and therefore, uh, you know, um, we'll have to talk about that when we come to the um, uh, findings on marriage. So I'll go into findings. So the first is, okay, the impact of COVID-19 on household income, livelihoods, and savings. This is something that this research has been done by many others as well. Um, it has been a major focus of research during the COVID-19 period. So there was significant decrease in household income and especially among the female-headed households. Food consumption um, um, and, and, that's, and the decrease in income was fairly similar in all uh, districts, but food consumption varied and women in Gaibandha were the most likely, one third women were, um, in Gaibandha were likely to have missed a meal um, during the lockdown. Savings had been used up and loans taken for household consumption included um, and also include uh, household consumption as well as dowry and household repairs. Livelihoods were um, affected, especially uh, for the daily laborers and the small businessmen, business entrepreneurs. So this is a quote from um, a daily labor family um, where they said that it was not just that they didn't have work and they couldn't buy food, but even when they did have work, uh, when they went to buy food at the end of the day, the bazaars will be would be closed or the police would be chasing them away because of the lockdown. So they really had um, problems accessing food. Here we see uh, just a, a, a graph of, of, of the household income. As you can see, the household income really dipped during um, um, April to sorry, March to May 2020, and then it started going up again and reached the pre-COVID levels, well, nearly the pre-COVID levels quite soon. But um, we must remember that the losses that had incurred during that time, that effect lingered for a long time. So even if their incomes went up, uh, it doesn't mean that you know they were back to where they were. Um, in terms of the adolescents, um, so, um, we found 
Okay, so I, I, as I mentioned before, um, in Bangladesh, schools reopened in September, and schools um, for most children, classes uh, were had started once or twice a week. But the children were still very confused about, you know, whether and when regular school would start. There's a lot of confusion about examinations and the mode of examinations. There's some lost interest. Um, due to all this uncertainty, and, and because children did not have to be physically in school till that point, there was a lot of indecision about whether they're going to back to school or not. And um, indecision amongst uh, adolescents, uh, amongst parents as teachers as well. So our, um, our data on dropout, we actually got, um, we, uh, our, our data shows that there was a 3.5% increase in um, dropout rates during that time, but this is much lower than um, what other research has found. Um, for example, um, uh, the BB, PPRC BIGD research, we found that there was an 8% uh, decline in an uh, increase in dropouts, with 9% of the boys dropping out and 5.5% uh, of girls dropping out. So um, there, there is a connection between, um, you know, boys going into work and dropping out of school there. And um, teachers were also sort of very unsure of how many children would actually, I mean, they, they told us that we will actually know how many have dropped out in December when they start, they have to pay their exam fees um, and register for their exams. Uh, however, we found that time spent on education um, dropped, as you can see in, in, uh, on the slide. And amongst those who had decidedly dropped out, 31% had started working during COVID. But as we mentioned before, decisions regarding continuation of education was up in the air, and boys who had started working uh, really were hoping to come back to school, and girls who had got married were trying to negotiate giving their final exams um, and maybe continuing school even after that. Parents were trying to make up for the loss of their children's education by, um, uh, in the initial stage, they transferred them to madrasas because madrasas were long, uh, open longer. Uh, than, than uh, other schools, and or they kept tutors. And finally, and very importantly, um, children, the adolescents talked about their loss of interest in studying. They, they talked about their loss of, they, uh, they, they, them setting their sights lower because they were not sure. So suppose if somebody wanted to pass their uh, high, high school, uh, certificate, higher secondary certificate, now they thought that maybe I'll, study until matriculation, or if they wanted to become a um, nurse, uh, now they were unsure whether they would have the, uh, the, the qualifications for this. So for example, in this um, slide, you see this girl who was married, but who wanted to, who got married during COVID, um, had wanted to become, uh, uh, have a government job, and she thought that it might not work out. And of course, um, another very, um, sharp uh, young woman who a young lady who said that you know the assignment the assignment business was absolutely useless for learning because you could get all the answers on the internet so they were really sort of um, education was somewhere that we actually dropped the ball i think anyway so and returning to school we found that we asked the children first uh, what are the reasons for not returning to school so here you see that uh, not wanting to study is a major reason for not returning to school, but also can't afford to study, um, which is, uh, um, um, and then if they've gotten into work themselves or if school has closed. But then we ask them, they, what, which of these reasons were impacted by COVID-19? So obviously uh, the major impact was on school closure, but as we can see that they also connected COVID-19 with their not being able to afford studying anymore or not wanting to study anymore. Um, sorry, I still have a couple of slides to go. Um, so um, we asked households, uh, whether they, um, so not only um, did we ask uh, boys who were, who were present during our research uh, whether they were working or not, we also asked households whether any of their uh, adolescent boys had migrated for work uh, during this period, and 97 households said yes, and out of them, 84% said that the, the reason is COVID-19, and they would not have migrated for work uh, uh, 
if if not you know um, if not for the economic um, pressure, and we know that not all the migration took place in a safe way. So girls started doing more household work. We found that it was quite difficult to get girls who were working, but it was not the case that the girls didn't want to work. But we found that parents and girls were talking about how there were no socially acceptable livelihood options for girls as there were for boys, and the parents wanted the boys to go up because it was a uh, and they, they wanted work, uh, they used work as a way of keeping tabs on their, or, you know, keeping them safe or keeping them out of trouble. <clears throat> so uh, not only boys, girls also went, uh, migrated for work. And um, so their friends were not sure whether they're going to come back to the village or not. Um, very quickly, I uh, have three slides on adolescent work. This is the blue line is for boys and the orange line is for girls. You can see that um, this is the percentage of boys and girls in work, in paid work during COVID. And you can see that it peaks at a time which is just after the lockdown lifted in March 2020 and livelihoods started, you know, people started employing others. Um, and you can see that here the blue line is um, uh, those who work for less than an hour, the orange line is those who work for one to four hours a day. And you can see at that same period of time, um, there's a, a lot of children moved from working less than one hour to working uh, for one to four hours. And uh, also interestingly, um, if you look at this, you can see that uh, the orange line is uh, the household income and um, blue line is the adolescent's income. And you can see how the adolescent's work is sort of um, trying to compensate for the loss in their household income. I will now pass it on to Raid, uh, who will take this forward. Thank you so much, Lupitapa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here. I'll just pick it up from where Lupitapa has left it. Um, um, so, so far we have discussed about the existence of two possible mediums through which COVID can possibly expose the adolescents to vulnerabilities and risks um, of different dimensions. Uh, the one being the economic shock and the other is the school closure. Um, underage marriage with its own dedicated set of problems for the ones engaging in it um, could pot potentially be brought upon through either of the two. Um, however, in our research, we didn't find significant evidence to state that COVID has played a role in increasing the rate of underage marriages. In fact, the average age of the males and the female adolescents actually went up by around six months during the COVID period that we found from our sample that we surveyed. Um, however, of those parents who married their daughters off during this period, even though the number is relatively small to make a generalized claim, 50% uh, of the parents said that had there been no COVID or had there been no COVID, then they would not have married their daughters off. Um, uh, so, um, and if we're talking about um, the impact of COVID in this regard, uh, the negative shock and the uncertainty regarding education both can be actually attributed to uh, younger age marriages, um, though not very significant. Um, I can refer to a couple of comments from here um, or quotes. So one, so I'm I'm reading. If I could tell my parents the exact exam date, my wedding would have been postponed till then. The uncertainty scared my parents, and I was also only sitting home doing nothing. Um, this goes to show, from the aspect of a female adolescent, this goes to show the uh, economic, uh, the education-related uncertainty having some some sort of impact on early marriage. Um, moving on. Another element that came along with the COVID lockdown is the lockdown itself. And even when the national or local level lockdowns were lifted, um, there were some restrictions to socialization at the household level. And we have found that the greater the household level restrictions were greater uh, for girls than boys. And it was also greater for married girls as opposed to unmarried girls. 
Um, so that being said, uh, with some restriction to socializing, uh, they had to resort to online socializing. So we have found that the percentage of adolescents who own a smartphone have doubled from pre-COVID period to the period during the survey as can be seen from, uh, so this year, the blue line shows us the male, the percent of males that own a smartphone. The orange line shows us the percent of females that own a smartphone. Um, we can see that during pre-COVID, around 16% of the males owned smartphones while it went up almost to 32%, which is nearly doubled. Females, uh, compared to males, females tend to own smartphones um, at least one, males own smartphones five, five times more than females. And however, it doubled for females as well, the gap also doubled because, as I said, the ratio remained the same. Um, um, so yeah, so one reason for this access to or ownership of smartphones doubling is the fact that the ownership of a smartphone during the COVID period moved from a luxury to a necessity. It became a necessity because there were online classes being held um, and to continue their classes to still be in school, air quotes, so they had to take, participate in the class and they had to have access to phones. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, uh, and the reason, I, I, one thing of interest is the difference, the gap between the boys and girls who own smartphones. And one of the reasons this has happened is can be attributed to the socioeconomic situation of the females where they're not prioritized as much as the boys. Also, access to mobile phones providing potential pathways to romantic relations through social media, particularly for females, is some things the, the parents are worried about in general. Now, moving from ownership to usage, the usage of phones increased the most during the lockdown. So here, the different bars of different colors show us the uh, percentage of uh, people who spent more than three hours on mobile, on mobile phones. So we can see that, so the orange bar here is the during lockdown period, and we can see before lockdown, only 13% of the adolescents used uh, the mobile phone for more than three hours. And during lockdown, it went up to 29%. And however, it came down as the lockdown situation eased up, uh, there's still a 4.5 percentage point gap between the pre-lockdown and the post-lockdown or during the survey period. In. So as we have seen, the usage has increased. Um, there's this definite, and as we are talking about vulnerabilities and risks, so with the usage of mobile phone and the ownership of mobile phones increasing, there's uh, this certain risk that comes up in the form of cyber crimes. And we asked them about cyber crimes, and when asked about it, 65% of the adolescents reported that they think, according to their perception, that cyber crime has increased compared to pre-COVID times, 65%, so yeah. Um, due to COVID, family members and outsiders ran out of jobs and money, so there was more strain. The adolescents were more available, and there was this combination of stress and spare time to the grown-ups, which may potentially have exposed the adolescents to violence and harassment. Uh, we looked into that, and we asked about verbal, verbal abuse, physical harassment, sexual violence, faced from family members and outsiders. And we found out that the younger adolescents experience more violence than the older ones, violence from outsiders face, uh, than the older ones. And as for the pre-COVID and post-COVID differentials, we found that violence from outsiders faced by male adolescents went from Five point, roughly about 5.5% to a two percentage point jump to 7.57% from pre-COVID to post-COVID. Um, questions or indicators regarding violence, everything else remain more, more or less similar across the COVID period. Only this is something where we found a two percentage point jump. Another thing of interest would be that the female adolescents report sexual harassment more in general compared to males. 
Um, however, for the males or the females, there we didn't find much change or any significant change pre-COVID or post -COVID versus post-COVID. Um, for one to reach out for justice, the first step is identification or detection of the offense. We ask those who face harassment of some sort if they consider it an offense. And as can be seen from the figure, tolerance for harassment by family house, family or household members is much higher compared to harassment by outsiders. We can see here that um, the orange bar shows um, the percentage of males that consider harassment by a family member as an offense or operat, as we have, uh, as we phrased it in our questionnaire. Um, which when, 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 when this offense is committed by an outsider when, or this act of harassment is committed by an outsider, this, there's a very steep jump. So harassment by outsider, more than 72% of the males consider har similar harassments committed by outsiders as offenses. For females, we find, we also find a jump, but the jump is not as, as much as the male, as their male counterparts. This may be, um, this can be attributed to the differences in nature of the harassment faced by the females and the males. Perhaps the females have been desensitized, perhaps they have internalized some of the harassment given that they face it on a regular basis. Um, and this can have potential implications on women reaching out for justice. And finally, moving on to activities posing risk to adolescents. Even though in the KII, the adolescents were said to be involved in drugs, um, trafficking, and gang violence, the extent is hard to measure due to respondents being unwilling to admit to such things due to the stigma attached to these issues. Government data is also unavailable to these uh, unavailable. So people have to go by their impressions of what they think has happened around them. So even the KIIs that we have uh, gathered information of from uh, failed to provide any concrete evidence on this matter. So at this stage of the presentation, I would request Mahin Sultan Appa to take it from here for the concluding thirds. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mahin. Uh, so I'll talk about the issues of um, access to justice, our conclusions and um, some recommendations. Um, so as uh, Raid mentioned, we were interested in finding out what the adolescents thought was an offense and what they would do about it, where they would go. And we were also interested in uh, understanding their knowledge of various laws and the consequences of violating those laws. So we found that in fact, they have a very good knowledge overall of the legal age of marriage, especially of the girls' legal age of marriage, and the girls know it better than the boys. And they're also quite aware of the health consequences of early marriage, which we found interesting. And on the other hand, on the effect of um, issue of child labor, we found there, there was a little more confusion. That is it 15, is it after 15, is it 14? So they're less aware of the legal age of, uh, for child labor, but they are more aware of the consequences, the negative consequences. Um, they know that it can result in the children feeling depressed, getting ill. Um, so that is uh, an interesting finding. Um, in terms of uh, where they would go and where they should go, if they have any complaints or if they witness a child marriage or if they witness some kind of abduction or whatever. Um, so we asked them one was what they would like to do and another is what in fact they did. So if I talk about uh, their uh, wishes, they would much prefer to go to the community first. For them, um, uh, the uh, formal institutions are very distant in intimidating and they're not used to that. And they're in fact scared of going, let's say to the police and the court is even further away. So they're aware they can go to the UP chairman and the members as well as the Madhbars, but um, they're also, they feel more constrained 
to go and talk about issues such as violence, crime, child marriage, because they feel that if they were to report such a case, the person they are reporting against would might take action against them and they would be singled out. So there's a fear of being identified as uh, telling others. Um, in terms of local administration and police, they feel that they won't even be allowed into those premises and they won't be heard. And if they say anything, they might even be beaten up. They'll be blamed for whatever they've come to complain about. Um, on the other hand, we found that the adolescents were quite, uh, this is since the COVID period, they were quite aware of the different government initiatives that were being taken to provide relief, food, medicine, and some had got it through their families, some had not. They also knew about the helplines of where they could phone to get um, more assistance related to COVID. And um, in terms of uh, violence against women and other kinds of abuse, we, it was very interesting to see a very high uh, knowledge of um, these different helplines and people had even used them. Uh, there were cases where they had called up and they had got responses. And the fact that the government is now printing these on the textbooks, uh, it seems to have a very big impact. And also the children talked about uh, people going into classrooms and giving lectures from government uh, to where to go and whom to phone. Um, there were a very limited number of adolescents in our sample, about 60, who had the experience of having faced some sort of a conflict, having had to complain, uh, having got into a fight, or, uh, you know, having seen a child marriage happening. Um, but most had, in fact, um, just gone to their families. And here also, um, when asked about uh, if they thought that COVID had affected their chances of getting access to justice, they felt that it had not mainly. You'll see that in fact, it's the same. But one of the reasons may be that they have so little experience of really having gone through the process and they have seen their parents go through it or other relatives. But um, what was interesting is that there's a lot of cynicism also that if I go through the process or if my family goes to the UP, will we be heard? Will it be a fair trial, uh, a fair hearing rather? Uh, because they will rule in favor of those who are more powerful in the village. Uh, there was also talk of corruption. So there's a lot of um, things, factors holding back the adolescents that they feel that even if they do go through these processes, they won't be heard. Um, just to add that when we talked about, uh, when we talked to the key informants, they also brought out issues um, around uh, child marriage uh, enforcement with the committees not being able to take much action, doing more awareness raising, but when it came to stopping a marriage, neither the marriage registrars nor the local government authorities were willing to take any concrete steps. Um, talking to the probation officers, we also got the impression that they were overstretched and it was very hard to follow up on the cases. Though they were able, and they're also talking to the police, they were able to reduce the violence faced by uh, children in conflict with the law, but they also felt that the follow-up wasn't as much as they would like to do. Um, also, um, in terms of um, the COVID period, the courts were able to deal with bail matters, but other cases were very much delayed. And just to raise the issue of elopements versus abductions, um, what goes to the court is often shown as an uh, abduction in case of child marriage, but sometimes it's case of a willful elopement. So how should the law deal with it? So to go on to our conclusions, um, going back to our research questions, in terms of uh, the first was whether the risks and vulnerabilities have increased because of COVID and because of poverty. And just the first thing is that the risks of school dropout, early marriage and child labor are real risks. Um, but whether it is because of poverty or other factors, we would have to you know, um, discuss. 
because security considerations seem to us very, very important that when talking to the parents and the adolescents, it wasn't that because of poverty that we're having to be married or to go into work. It was because the children being out of school, hanging around, it's a risk for the family, it's a reputational risk, it's a risk for the child. And so they would rather put them into some sort of structure, social structure. Um, as Raid has mentioned, the age at which um, girls were married was not less, but we need to know if there were more marriages of that age. Uh, decisions to put boys to work was driven by also security concerns. And uh, dif gender difference is that status and security concerns are more important for girls, the social reputational risk. The choices made by parents uh, were they leading, and the adolescents, were they leading to greater vulnerability? Yes, um, because we had cases of early marriage and these interviews were very uh, painful to do because we could see the risk for the girl and for the child and for her future. Um, the migration for uh, work also, we could see that the young boys and some girls were going into very dangerous unknown situations with little protection. And if they survived that migration, it was just by luck. There was no protection for them. Another big area of risk was internet access. Um, because of education, parents provided them with phones, but this increased their time and addiction to the internet and also uh, cyber harassment and bullying. And also because the girls were not provided as much access to the phones as boys were, there's another kind of discrimination that was coming in. In terms of our third question and support mechanisms, were these meeting the adolescent needs? In fact, uh, the, the biggest support mechanisms were the family and the community, and that's where the adolescents turned to. The schools would have been uh, very important support mechanisms, but they were closed and the teachers were out of touch uh, with the parents. And the other mechanisms such as the UP told us that, well, we have been more active, we've been going out, police presence was greater, but since the adolescents didn't trust these institutions, this was not much of a support. And, and just to flag this issue of lack of privacy, that the adolescents did not feel able to complain for being signaled, signaled out singled out, sorry. And um, so if they said if they had their own phone, they would be more willing to complain, but going through somebody else would uh, result in them being identified. And finally, our main recommendations are three, and you'll find it uh, more detailed in the policy brief. Um, the first is that the COVID has taught us that we need to address the vulnerabilities that adolescents face to make their lives safe and secure for the future. And here it's um, the access to education should be made anti-fragile, we'll come back to that. There should be opportunities for work. Uh, there should be um, a pr um, promotion of alternative aspirations, uh, child management, uh, sorry, child marriage prevention committees should be more active. Mental health should be addressed. So these are some of the vulnerabilities which need addressing. The strengthening of responsive and adolescent friendly support mechanisms is also very important because the mechanisms are sometimes there, but they are not geared towards the adolescents. Uh, the probation officers, some of the judges dealing with these cases all mention that people involved need much more training in even you know how to communicate with an adolescent. It's not the same as an adult, obviously. Um, the issue of the uh, CMRA, the Child Marriage Restraint Act, having to be rethought, how do we deal with elopements and adolescent sexuality and romances? Um, privacy, um, access, these issues need thinking about. And finally, strengthening the governance and accountability of government mechanisms and personnel. Um, the birth registration system, marriage registration system, if these worked and people who are carrying these out, if they were accountable for giving accurate information, accurate registration, uh, some of these problems might have been avoided. Uh, if, the if the marriage registrars and the local government authorities were responsible 
are accountable for the child marriages that they allow to happen, that might also have an uh, effect in preventing these. So some of these mechanisms are in place, but they are not functioning and they need to be made more functional. Thank you. Thank you, Maina Palopita Panrad Pai, for your presentation. We will now move on to our panel discussion. Uh, before that, I would like to request our presenters to please uh, take their seat in the audience. And uh, we will, uh, I would like to request our panelists, Mr. M. M. Mahmudullah, Additional Director, Social Safety Net Wing, Department of Social Services, Ms. Shima Muslim, Joint General Secretary, Bangladesh Mohila Porishad, Dr. Shafiqul Islam, former director, Education Brack, and Dr. Zinia Afroz, Clarissa Country Coordinator, Dr. Des Om, to come to the stage. The panel discussion will be moderated by Dr. Imran Mateen, Executive Director, Bragg Institute of Governance and Development, followed by an open discussion. The discussion will take place in both Bangla and English, and uh, the Bengali part will be translated later on. Thank you. The panel discussion and open discussion will take place in two parts, with the first part being comments by Dr. Zinia Froze to highlight the implications of the research for child labor and Ms. Shima Muslim to discuss the implications for child marriage. Over to you, Imran. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so that was a very, I think, quite a dense presentation with, 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 with lots to absorb. Um, it would have been good if you could open up, you know, have a bit of a Q&A for clarification, but I think that's fine. You can get to it. So the way we are structuring this is uh, there are four themes on which we're going to, you know, kind of try and unpack a bit more and listen from experts who are going to be discussing the topic. So the four topics are we're going to be talking about child labor, uh, child marriage, We'll talk about conflict with the law, and we'll talk about education loss and recovery. So there is four themes, if you like, that we'll try and unpack a bit more. So let's start with uh, child labor, which obviously came up very, very strongly. And I think you know it's sort of very clear that that is a real risk that we're seeing. Though, if you, if you just remember that what we're seeing is, uh, it's more the one to four hours work that really seems to be the more predominant teacher, uh, uh, that, that really is increasing. But until now, that's increasing. In the future, if school quality and educational quality doesn't really pick up, that may actually become more full-time work. So there are those type of risks. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's the kind of general finding that I think uh, uh, in the context of which I would really uh, now request uh, Ms. Genia Afrosa. Uh, she's a Clarissa County Director and uh, uh, works at uh, uh, Terje Homes. Uh, and I'll ask her to, uh, Dr. Ginny Afros, to uh, give her comments on, on the child labor and help us you know, perhaps unpack it a bit more and, and, and think about you know, the kind of policy-related uh, policy intervention there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imran Bhai. And um, thank you to my colleagues at PIGD for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share um, the panel with other um, esteemed panelists. It was, it was very fascinating uh, research, and uh, I think it brings out some of the um, some of the harsh realities of the lives of adolescents uh, that they experienced during COVID. COVID is not over yet, and uh, probably during the time when the research was conducted, it was just after the after the second lockdown but if we look at if we get the opportunity to look at the long term consequences i i'm sure it will be even more harsher but uh, this brings out um, through using the mixed method research um, um, and giving insight into the qualitative side of it i think it brings out nicely some of the complexities that we are talking about and and as um, the presenters said it's real 
Um, so it's not only in the in the thinking side. So I have taken a few notes and my thoughts are not quite organized as yet. I think it would be good to get some time to reflect on it, but I'll I will be not that organized, but I will try to focus on a few areas that I picked up during the presentation. Um, so I think, I mean, one thing that is that was very evident was the interconnectedness of the different types of risk that adolescents experience. So it's it's important that we don't look at the problems in isolation. So when whenever we're talking about education, child labor, child marriage, social security, overall well-being, I think it's important that we look at the uh, look, try to connect the threats and to see that how one thing connects to to the other and also i think um it uh, it is it is insightful to see that how um how the different risks have causal relationship with uh, covid-19 because it was um clear that covid-19 resulted in a school closure there was uh, uh, children were left with limited choice so how many how i mean what choices uh, that adolescents have um, and uh, parents have, and uh, and we need to work within the constraint of those uh, choices. So as a result, there is an increase in children's engagement in work, and also, I mean, it's useful to see that uh, the social security issue in terms of child marriage or work. I mean, what else can I do? That there was a quotation, uh, something like that, that. Um, uh, yeah, so what to do? So instead of doing nothing, um, getting married is considered to be a, a, a better option or instead of just roaming around the streets and doing nothing, um, getting into work is considered to be a better option. So we probably need to be better prepared in terms of how to engage adolescents um, in, the, in this difficult time when school was closed for a longer period and they did not have any alternative to engage themselves with um and uh yeah i think it's not uh so it's it's not a surprise but it's also i mean insightful to see how traditional social and gender norms play out in in um you know, deepening the vulnerabilities that adolescents already have in terms of either access to education or decision to engage in work. And uh, I think adolescents' contribution to um, household work and paid work is, is the most underrated uh, thing, especially women's contribution to unpaid work. Um, so this is something that needs to be taken seriously. So um, it shows that boys had more option uh, in terms of socially dignified jobs, and that relates to social security again. So what options uh, girls are left with? And uh, that is something I think we can um, pick up. And um, yeah, I think, uh, um, yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, child labor is a reality, right? It's uh, it's um, uh, in the in the context of Bangladesh and many other other countries in the world. Um, e ending child labor is not an immediate solution. So if we if we um, look at, I mean, if we aim to look at um, uh, ending child labor, then probably it will push children more into some hidden spaces and worse form of labor and exploitative work. Um, probably this. This study did not give us the scope to go deeper into that, but through other work uh, that is happening, we see that when we try to end child labor, then there is higher risk of children uh, to be into more exploitative work. So I think finding alternative livelihood opportunities um, is, is uh, probably could be one way to prepare the adolescents more uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, managing, managing the shocks in this difficult time. And... Uh, Probably future research could also explore those hidden spaces where child labor happens in its worst form. Um, social safety net is something, uh, Mudula Bhai is there, I'm sure you will be uh, talking about that um, yeah, soon. But uh, uh, it, it is, I think, in terms of managing shock and managing any crisis, it's important to have a social, strong social support and safety net um, so that. Uh, I mean, parents can be reassured and they get the support that uh, they need for the, for them and the, for their children. And it's crucial. I mean, we, we saw that it's, it was 
it was not um, available to those who needed the most during uh, during the COVID crisis. So uh, this is something that I think it's very important to look into consideration. Um, yeah, and, uh, adaptation is I think important instead of looking at uh, managing this crisis in a you know linear monolithic way. It's important to have adaptability in terms of the way education is provided, the way we approach uh, children's work. Um, so it's important that we better prepared ourselves uh, to manage the uncertainties of this ever changing world and uh, take take the learning from from uh, what we have uh, through various evidences and try to adapt and be a little innovative in our thinking of how we manage those crises. So I would say uh, social protection, uh, skill-based education, safer economic opportunities could be could be the options, yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Those are, those are very, very thoughtful um, remarks. And, um, and I think we'll, we'll obviously try and weave these things together. I think as we uh, continue the conversation, uh, in terms of the different domains, but I think you raised a number of very important points around, you know, thinking about in a more interconnected way. I think that's really critical as we try and look at this uh, across the different uh, domains. But I think the last point about having a more uh, adaptable approach uh, to managing this type of crisis, I think, is, so, is sort of something that, that sort of requires a deeper conversation. And uh, what does it really mean in terms of the implementation dynamics? Because one of the biggest challenge of emergency response is preparing for it before the emergency happens, but then creating governance mechanism through which this can be implemented very, very quickly. That is at the heart of any emergency response. Uh, so, uh, so I think that, you know, the, how do we design bureaucracy to be able to really uh, deliver uh, in a more responsive way? I think, I think it's sort of a very important topic that uh, would be good to sort of unpack. Uh, uh, so I think thank you very much for bringing that on. And I think generally the point about, uh, you know, kind of uh, looking at, you know, alternative opportunities, but also alternative educational opportunities, because if these are one to four hour long, more or less part-time work, there may be opportunities to weave in education differently, but we need to think about education more creatively. And I'm sure these are the topics we'll, we'll sort of come back to Shofik by towards, uh, towards the end. But let's now move on to the second uh, topic. Uh, and uh, 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 Shima Muslim Abba will, will speak. She'll speak in Bangla. Uh, I think she has chosen to speak in Bangla. So we'll listen to her and then we'll, 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 we'll have someone translate it, okay? Uh, I am more comfortable in Bengali, so I did have my speech in discussion in Bengali. After the government dissemination of the Dhanuti Titi Mantra, we have seen the Shuddhi Jala. 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 এই অভিঘাতে গোটা বিশ্বই কিন্তু আজকে পরিবর্তিত হয়ে গেছে সেখানে বাংলাদেশ তো অবশ্যই এবং এই পরিবর্তন কেবলমাত্র কোন একটা ক্ষেত্রে না এটা অর্থনৈতিক সামাজিক মানসিক স্বাস্থ্যগত সকল ক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু এই অভিঘাত এসেছে এবং যা গোটা পৃথিবীর চিত্রপটি আজকে পরিবর্তন করে দিয়েছে এবং সেখানে আমরা যদি নারীর অবস্থাটা দেখি সেটা কিন্তু দেখি নারী যেহেতু একটা প্রান্তিকতায় থাকে সে কিন্তু আরো প্রান্তিক হয়ে গেছে আমরা বাংলাদেশ মহিলা পরিষদের পক্ষ থেকে আমরা কোভিড এর পর পরই মানে 2020 এর শেষাশেষি আমরা একটা শ্রমজীবী নারীদের উপর একটা আমরা একটা জরিপ কাজ করেছিলাম এবং সেই জরিপ কাজে আমরা দেখেছি 26 টি জেলায় আমরা এই জরিপ কাজটা করি এবং সেই জরিপ কাজে আমরা দেখেছি যে তারা যে বক্তব্যগুলো দিয়েছেন শ্রমজীবী নারীরা যেখানে অধিকাংশই বলেছেন তারা কাজ হারিয়েছেন তারা স্থানচ্যুত হয়েছে শহরে কাজ করতেন তাদের গ্রামে চলে যেতে বাধ্য হয়েছে হয়েছে স্বামীও চাকরি হয়েছে হারিয়েছেন জীবন মান নিম্নমুখী হয়েছে অর্থনৈতিক নিরাপত্তাহীনতা বাড়ছে পারিবারিক সম্পর্কের অবনতি ঘটছে মানসিক চাপ দুশ্চিন্তা বৃদ্ধি পাচ্ছে এবং এর ফলে সহিংসতা বৃদ্ধি পাচ্ছে ডোমেস্টিক ভায়োলেন্স বৃদ্ধি পাচ্ছে এবং যেহেতু কোভিড কালীনে বিচার চাওয়ারও সুযোগটা খুব কমে গেছে বিচারও পাওয়া যাচ্ছে না সন্তানদের লেখাপড়া বন্ধ হয়ে যাচ্ছে পাশাপাশি বাল্য বিবাহ ও শিশু শ্রম বাড়ছে যারা আজকে স্কুল কর পড়তো তাদেরকে আজকে বাধ্য করা হচ্ছে হচ্ছে তারা শ্রম দিতে এইরকম একটা সিনারিও কিন্তু আমরা দেখছি কোভিড এর শুরু থেকে এবং যেটা কিন্তু এখনো পর্যন্ত 
মানে চলমানই রয়েছে বলা যায় সেখানে যে খুব একটা পরিবর্তন ঘটেছে তা কিন্তু ঘটে না এবং এই এই মানে জরিপটা যদিও আমরা শ্রমজীবী নারীদের উপর করেছিলাম কিন্তু আমরা এটাও জানি যে বাংলাদেশের নারীরা অধিকাংশ ইনফরমাল সেক্টরে কাজ করে ফরমাল সেক্টরে খুব কম নারী কাজ করে ইনফরমাল সেক্টরে যারা কাজ করেন মানে কোভিড এর শুরুতে কিন্তু তাদের এই ধরনের অধিকার তাদের উপর এসেছে এবং তারা কিন্তু একটা কর্মহীন নিরাপত্তাহীনতায় দিন কাটাচ্ছেন এবং সেখানে যদি আমরা দেখি সেখানে যে আপনাদের যে গবেষণা কাজটা ব্যয় যেটা করেছে যে অ্যাডোলেসেন্টের উপর এবং অ্যাডোলেসেন্টের উপর এই গবেষণাটা তো আসলে খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ কেননা আমরা এটা জানি একটা কিশোরী বা বয়সে যখন একটা নারীর জীবনের একটা মৌলিক অধিকার গুলো থেকে বঞ্চিত হয় তখন কিন্তু তাকে সারা জীবন সেটা বয়ে বেড়াতে হয় এবং তার সারা জীবনের এই যে সংকট এই সংকটটা কেবলমাত্র কিন্তু সেই ব্যক্তি নারী বা ব্যক্তি কিশোরীর জীবনে বয়ে চলে না সেটা কিন্তু ব্যক্তি থেকে পরিবার পরিবার থেকে রাষ্ট্রের সামাজিক অর্থনৈতিক কাঠামোতেও কিন্তু একটা নেতিবাচক প্রভাব বিস্তার করে কেননা এই যে একটা কিশোরী নারী তার যে শৈশবটা হারিয়ে গেল সেই শৈশবটা হারানোর ফলে সে যে একটা জীবনের মধ্যে ঢুকে গেল সেটা কিন্তু তার জন্য বিশেষ একটা সংকটময় পরিস্থিতি সৃষ্টি করে যেটা সামগ্রিক ভাবে রাষ্ট্র সমাজের ক্ষেত্রে একটা সংকটময় পরিস্থিতি এবং এইখানে কোভিড পরবর্তীতে আপনারা আপনার মানে এই গবেষণাটাতে কোভিড পরবর্তীতে নানা বিষয় নিয়ে করেছেন আমাকে যেহেতু বাল্য বিবাহটা নিয়ে আলোচনা করতে বলেছেন সেখানে আমি সীমাবদ্ধ থাকবো এবং সেখানে আমরা দেখেছি যে কোভিডের মানে অভিজ্ঞান কিশোরীদের মধ্যে দুটো বিশেষ ক্ষেত্রে ভীষণভাবে মানে বাধাগ্রস্ত করেছে যে দুটো ক্ষেত্রে হচ্ছে তাদের লেখাপড়া বন্ধ হয়ে যাওয়া এবং বাল্য বিবাহের শিকার হওয়া এবং এই দুটো কিন্তু তার সার্বিক ভাবে তার যে মানবাধিকার মানুষ হিসাবে যা তার অধিকার তার মানবাধিকার কিন্তু এই দুটো ক্ষেত্রে লঙ্ঘিত হচ্ছে যার ভয়াবহতা তাকে সারা জীবন বয়ে বেড়াতে হবে এবং তার সমাজ ও রাষ্ট্রকেও বয়ে বেড়াতে হবে এবং আমরা এটা দেখেছি যে যদিও মানে এই গবেষণায় বাল্য যে এলাকাগুলোতে যদি করা হয়েছে বাল্য বিভাগের সংখ্যা তুলনামূলক ভাবে অতটা আসেনি বা বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে এরকম তথ্য আসেনি কিন্তু আমরা সামগ্রিক ভাবে জানি যে আরো বিভিন্ন গবেষণা ব্র্যাকেরই একটি গবেষণাতে এসছে যে তেরো পার্সেন্ট বাল্য বিভাগের হার বেড়েছে এবং প্ল্যান ইন্টারন্যাশনালের গবেষণা তারপর আমরা বাংলাদেশ মহিলা পরিষদ যেহেতু আমাদের তৃণমূল ভিত্তিক সংগঠন আমরা প্রতি মুহূর্তে কোভিড পিরিয়ডে আমাদের অন্য কাজ কতটুকু করতে পেরেছি কেননা ফিজিক্যালি কাজ করাটা তখন সংসাজনক ছিল কিন্তু নারীর প্রতি সহিংসতা এবং বাল্য বিবাহের বন্ধের কাজ এটা কিন্তু কোভিড পিরিয়ডে ধারাবাহিক ভাবে চলেছে বরঞ্চ আগের চেয়ে অনেক বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে এই কাজটা কিন্তু একদিনের জন্য বন্ধ হয়নি সুতরাং কোভিড পিরিয়ড যে বাল্য বিবাহ যে বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে সেটা কিন্তু আজকে একটা বাস্তবতা এই নির্দিষ্ট গবেষণায় হয়তো সেটা আসেনি কিন্তু এটা কিন্তু আজকে একটা বাস্তবতা এবং আমরা দেখেছি যে আমাদের বিভিন্ন আলোচনায় আমরা দেখেছি বিভিন্ন তথ্য তো আমরা দেখেছি তৃণমূল পর্যায়ে যে এই বিষয়ের তথ্য গুলো কিন্তু আমরা সব সময় পেয়েছি এবং এখানে একটা বাল্য বিবাহ হওয়ার ফলে যেটা আমি শুরুতে একটু বললাম যেটা সেটা খালি মেয়ে শিশুর মৌলিক অধিকার লঙ্ঘন করছে তা না সেটা কিন্তু শিশু আইনেরও লঙ্ঘন এটাও কিন্তু আমাদের বিবেচনার মধ্যে নিতে হবে এবং বাল্য বিবাহের ফলে সেই কিশোরী মেয়েটি যে সংকটের সৃষ্টি হয় তা একটি বিষচক্রের মতো তার লাইফটা কিন্তু একটা ভিজুয়াল ইয়ের মতো চলে যায় তার মধ্যে প্রথমে তার শৈশবটা নষ্ট হয় তার শিক্ষা জীবন শেষ হয় তার স্বাস্থ্যের ঝুঁকি তৈরি হয় তাই সে অপুষ্ট সন্তানের জন্ম দেয় সে সহিংসতার শিকার হয় সে ক্ষমতায়িত হতে পারে না সে আরো প্রান্তিক হয়ে যায় এবং এই প্রান্তিকতা কিন্তু তার ওই কিশোরী বারো চোদ্দ পনেরো বছর থেকে শুরু করে সে যতদিন বেঁচে থাকবে এই প্রান্তিকতার মধ্যে তাকে বেঁচে থাকতে হবে সুতরাং তার জীবনটা কিন্তু পরিপূর্ণ ভাবে আমরা একটা সংকটময় পরিস্থিতির মধ্যে ফেলে দিচ্ছি আমরা এবং এগুলো ফলে যে নেতিবাচক রাষ্ট্রে বা সমাজে অভিজ্ঞান সৃষ্টি করে সেটা কিন্তু রাষ্ট্রীয় ভাবে বিভিন্ন সামাজিক সুযোগে কিন্তু রাষ্ট্র পিছিয়ে যাচ্ছে আমরা যে এসডিজির কথা বলছি দুই হাজার তিরিশের মধ্যে আমরা এসডিজি বাস্তবায়ন করব সেই এসডিজি বাস্তবায়নের ক্ষেত্রেও কিন্তু একটা বড় বাধা সৃষ্টি করবে এই কোভিড পিরিয়ডের এই জিনিসগুলোকে যদি আমরা প্রপারলি আমরা অ্যাড্রেস না করি বাল্য বিয়ের কারণ এবং সামাজিক অভিঘাত এই বিষয়ে আমরা বাংলাদেশ মহিলা পরিষদ একটা গবেষণা কাজ করছি যেটা রিপোর্ট এখনো বের হয়নি হয়তো এক পাশের মধ্যে বের হয়ে যাবে সেখানে আমরা বাল্য বিবাহে হয়েছে বা বাল্য বিবাহের শিকার মেয়েদের কিছু মন্তব্য যদি আপনাদের সামনে উপস্থাপন করতে করি তাহলে মানে আপনাদের গবেষণাতেও এসছে এটা যে মেয়েরা বা মেয়েদের মেয়েরা বেশি জানে যে বিয়ের বয়স কতটা 
কোন বয়স পর্যন্ত মানে তাদের জীবনের অভিজ্ঞতা থেকে তার জীবনের বেদনা থেকে জীবনের মানে কি বলবো সংকট থেকে কিন্তু তারা এই বিষয়ে অনেক বেশি কনসাস এবং অনেক বেশি অ্যাওয়ার হয়ে রয়েছে সেখানে যদি আমি কয়েকটা মন্তব্য এখানে আপনাদের সামনে একটু উপস্থাপন করি একটু হয়তো সময় নিচ্ছি যে সেখানে যেমন তারা বলেছে যে বাল্য বিবাহ একেবারে বন্ধ করতে না পারলে অনেক মেয়ের জীবন নষ্ট হয়ে যাবে অল্প বয়সে সংসারের কিছুই বুঝি না শ্বশুর শাশুড়ি স্বামীর মন পাওয়া কঠিন হয় প্রতি মুহূর্তে বকা ঝকা আর সহিংসতা শিকার হচ্ছে শরীর নষ্ট হয়ে যাচ্ছে শুধু শিক্ষা হয় না খেলাধুলা থেকেও আমরা বঞ্চিত হই তার মানে কিশোরী মেয়েটার মনটা কোন জায়গায় আছে দেখে তার খালি লেখাপড়া হচ্ছে না সেটা সে বলছে সে যে খেলাধুলাও করতে পারছে না তার মানে তার মানসিকতাটা কিন্তু তখনই শৈশবেই রয়েছে কিন্তু তখনই কিন্তু আমরা তার ধারে একটা সংসারের জল তুলে দিচ্ছি আবার আমার বাবা মা যে ভুল করেছেন আর কারো বাবা মা যেন এই ভুল না করেন মেয়েরা এদেশের নাগরিক সরকারের দায়িত্ব আমাদের অগ্রসর করে নেওয়ার সুযোগ দেওয়া আমাদের সুন্দরভাবে বাঁচতে দিন জনপ্রতিনিধি চেয়ারম্যান প্রশাসনের দায়িত্ব আরো পালন করতে হবে তারা বাল্য বিবাহ কেন আটকাচ্ছে না দরিদ্রতার জন্য দরিদ্রতার জন্য বিয়ে এটা কোনো সমাধান নয় বিয়ের পরেও তো আমাকে দারিদ্রতা থেকে মুক্তি পাচ্ছি না নিরাপত্তা পাচ্ছি না মানে বাল্য বিয়ের ফলে কিশোরী কন্যাটির জীবনের বিকাশের যে সুযোগটা হারিয়ে যাচ্ছে সে কিন্তু নিজেও সেটা অনুভব করছে কিন্তু সেই অনুভবটা আজকে রাষ্ট্রীয় পর্যায়ে রাজনীতি নির্ধারণে আছে সামাজিক ভাবে আমরা যারা সামাজিক কাজ করছি তাদের কাছে এই জিনিসটা আসতে হবে এবং এখানে যদি আমরা তাহলে মনে করি যে বাল্য বিবাহ কিভাবে এই শিশু কিশোরীদের জীবনের যে অধিকার বা শিশু কিশোরীদের জীবনের যে অগ্রসর হয়ে যাওয়ার সুযোগ সেই সুযোগটাকে আমরা কিভাবে আমরা বাস্তবায়িত করব। বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ আর বাল্য বিবাহ প্রতিরোধ এই দুটা কিন্তু এক নয় এই কথাটা আমাদের সবসময় মনে রাখতে হবে বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ আমি কয়টা করলাম কয়টা বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ করা গেল আদৌ গেল কিনা কারণ আমরা আমাদের বিভিন্ন সরজীবনের কাজে আমরা দেখি যে বাল্য বিবাহ দেওয়া হচ্ছে পুলিশ নিয়ে প্রশাসন নিয়ে সেখানে যাওয়া হলো বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ হলো বন্ধ হলো কিন্তু সাত দিন পর সেই মেয়েটাকে আর পাওয়া যাচ্ছে না আর এক জেলায় যেয়ে তাকে বিয়ে দিয়ে দেওয়া হচ্ছে সুতরাং বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ আমরা কতটা করতে পারছি তার থেকে বাল্য বিবাহ কিভাবে প্রতিরোধ করা যায় সেখানটাই কিন্তু আমাদের নজর দেওয়া বেশি প্রয়োজন সেখানে এবং সেখানে এই জিনিসটাও বোঝা যাবে যে মানে আপনাদের সার্ভেতেও সেটা এসছে যে সব এলাকার বাল্য বিবাহের কারণ এক ধরনের নাও হতে পারে বিষয়টাকে বিবেচনায় নিয়ে কিন্তু আমাদের কৌশলগত নানা রকম কর্মসূচি নিতে হবে স্ট্র্যাটেজিক প্ল্যানিং করতে হবে যে সব জেলায় সব এলাকায় একই ধরনের না এবং স্থানীয় সরকারের প্রতিনিধিরা এবং প্রশাসনকে এখানে দায়বদ্ধ করতে হবে কেন আমরা জানি যখন আমরা কাজীদেরও আমাদের এই সার্ভেতে আমরা কাজীদেরও ইন্টারভিউ নিয়েছি ম্যাজিস্ট্রেটদের ইন্টারভিউ নিয়েছি তারা যখন বলে যে আমার কাছে যখন জন্ম সনদ নিয়ে আসে সেখানে আমি দেখি সে প্রাপ্তবয়স্ক বিয়ের বয়স হয়েছে কিন্তু সেই জন্ম সনদ হয়তো মিথ্যা সেটা কাজীও জানেন ম্যাজিস্ট্রেটও জানেন কিন্তু সেটা নিয়ে কিন্তু তারা প্রশ্ন তোলেন না সুতরাং এই যে বার্থ সার্টিফিকেট যারা দেন স্থানীয় সরকারি চেয়ারম্যানরা যারা দেন সেখানে যে দুর্নীতি অসাধুতা আছে সেটাকে আমরা কিভাবে ট্যাকল করব সেই জন্য যদি জন্ম সনদ জন্ম নিবন্ধন এগুলো যদি ডিজিটালাইজ করা যায় এটা ডাটাবেস করা যায় তাহলে কিন্তু সকল কাজী এবং সকল ম্যাজিস্ট্রেটদের কাছে কিন্তু এটার রেকর্ডটা থাকবে তারা কিন্তু সেখানেই তার জন্ম সনদ এবং আমাদের এই তরুণীরা এটা কিশোরীরা এটাও বলেছে যে আমাদের স্কুল থেকে যদি আমাদের বার্থ ডেটটা জানে স্কুলের বার্থ ডেটটা তো আসল থাকে সেটা জানলে তো আমাদের এই এই চেয়ারম্যান সাহেব এই বার্থ সার্টিফিকেট দিতে পারেন না সেই শিশু কিশোরীরাই কিন্তু এই কথা বলতে শুধু সেইখানে যদি আমরা একটা ডাটাবেস তৈরি করা যায় যেটা ডিজিটালি করা যায় সেটা কিন্তু একটা মানে এটাকে কি বলবো মনিটর করার একটা সুযোগ হবে এবং এই জিনিসটা আমাদের মনে করতে হবে যে বাল্য বিবাহ যেমন একটা বিশ্বচক্র সৃষ্টি করে তেমনি এটাকে প্রতিকারের জন্য একটা হলিস্টিক অ্যাপ্রোচ নিতে হবে এখানে একদিকে যেমন অ্যাওয়ারনেস বাড়াতে হবে তেমনি আমাদের স্থানীয় সরকার প্রশাসনকে এক্ষেত্রে অ্যাক্টিভ করবে যেটা আপনাদের এখানেও এসেছে বাল্য বিবাহ প্রতিরোধ কমিটি প্রত্যেকটা জেলাতেই আছে কিন্তু সেই প্রতিরোধ কমিটি কতটুকু অ্যাক্টিভ তারা কি কাজ করছে মহিলা বিষয়ক মন্ত্রণালয়ের কিন্তু একজন করে অফিসার প্রত্যেকটা জেলাতেই আছেন কিন্তু সে তাদের কাজগুলো কি হচ্ছে সেইগুলো মনিটর করা এই জিনিসটাতে একান্তই অভাব আমাদের দেশে যেটা সবচেয়ে বড় সমস্যা আইন আছে ইমপ্লিমেন্টেশন নাই মনিটরিং নাই ইমপ্লিমেন্টেশন মনিটরিংটা যতদিন না হবে ততদিন কিন্তু আসলে আইনের কোনো অর্থ থাকে না আইন বাস্তবায়নের কোনো পথও সৃষ্টি হয় না সুতরাং আজকে এই বিষয়গুলো বিবেচনা করে আজকে আমাদেরকে বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধের দিকে অগ্রসর হতে হবে আর আপনাদের গবেষণায় একটা বিষয় এসেছে যে অনেক রেসপন্ডেন্ট বলেছেন কিছু কিছু বাবা মা বলেছেন যে ব
এটার জন্য একটা আইন আছে এবং আইনে যে ক্লসটা দিয়েছে সেই ক্লসটা পরিবর্তনের জন্য নারী আন্দোলন কিন্তু আন্দোলন করে যাচ্ছে যে বাবা মার ইচ্ছা থাকলে প্রয়োজন মনে করলে কোর্টের পারমিশন নিয়ে বিয়ে দিতে পারবে এটা আমরা মনে করি যে এটা আর একটা বাল্য বিবাহ দেওয়ার একটা পথ তৈরি করা হলো সুতরাং এটা নিয়ে আমরা আন্দোলন করছি সেখানে কিন্তু এই কথাটা আসলেও সেই কথাটা যে বাবা মা বাল্য বিবাহ দিয়েছেন তারা তো তাদের পক্ষ থেকে কথাটা বলবেন সুতরাং এটাকে আমি কিভাবে আমার বক্তব্য দিয়ে যেটা যে সঠিকটা সেটা কিন্তু আমার কনক্লুশনে বা কোথাও আসা উচিত সবশেষে এই কথাটাই বলবো যে বাংলাদেশের সংবিধানের যে অঙ্গীকার নারী পুরুষের সমতা সেটাকে যদি আমি বাস্তবায়িত করতে চাই অবশ্যই বাল্য বিবাহ বন্ধ করতে হবে একটা কিশোরীর জীবনের শুরুতেই তার মানব অধিকার লঙ্ঘন করার কোন অধিকার বা ক্ষমতা সমাজ বা রাষ্ট্রের কারণে ধন্যবাদ সকলকে Good morning, everyone. I am Farhana Kubir. I am a research associate at Bangladesh uh, Bragg Institute of Governments and Development. So uh, as the speech uh, was quite e extensive, I will try to summarize it in a few words. So um, this, uh, Ms. Shima Muslim emphasized on the fact that child marriage is a form of human rights violation. She uh, started with the fact that COVID has affected our lives in, uh, in all aspects and especially the adolescents' lives in all aspects. Um, the Bangladesh Mohila Parishad has done a survey uh, after uh, COVID on working women where they, uh, where they found uh, in, in the results of the survey that they found that the standard of living of the woman, uh, working women went down, domestic violence increased, uh, women lost their jobs more, uh, their um, counterparts also lost their jobs and all of these negative impacts uh, brought about more negative impacts in the children. And so their children went into child labor more. Uh, most of the uh, women uh, in Bangladesh work in informal sector and just when COVID hit, they were hit uh, the most because they uh, almost, uh, most of them lost their jobs and they, they became more vulnerable to domestic violence. And this was especially uh, more uh, prevalent in the case of female headed households. Adolescents uh, vulnerabilities are more important in, a, in because uh, it, imp uh, it Im impacts the adolescents from the very childhood because it um, it affects their childhood to their family life, to their society, societal life and everything beyond. So um, the fact that child marriage has increased in Bangladesh has made girls more, uh, more prone to vulnerabilities. Some other surveys um, done by some other NGOs and also BRAC found that child marriages had increased during COVID. Um, child marriage is against... Um, human rights, as she mentioned, and the girl's uh, childhood, um, the fact that the girl's childhood ends when child marriage happens has more implications as they are more prone to early pregnancies and complications to their health and as well as their mental well-being. Uh, this also affects the SDG goals uh, and will set back Bangladesh to achieving the SDG goals even further. Uh, she also mentioned that Bangladesh Mohila Parishad did another uh, survey on child marriage where they found uh, the children to know uh, the children to know about the harmful effects of child marriage. She mentioned uh, some quotes about uh, some quotes from those children. And they found one of the quotes where that marriage is not a solution for, for poverty. Uh, the children realized that and they were very much against child marriage. Um, so Miss um, uh, Shima also uh, mentioned that child marriage prevention and stopping child marriage are two different aspects that need, needs to be worked on because sometimes we see in Bangladesh where child marriage, um, stopping child marriage, uh, when the government goes to stop a child marriage, after a few uh, days, they see that the child marriage happened anyway. So that's why the focus needs to be on prevention more. And the reason uh, and the reason for child marriage is not same across all the upajalas of Bangladesh. So a holistic approach is needed. And uh, she also mentioned that the birth certificate registration and NID registration uh, has a, uh, has a lot of uh, corruption in it. So they're not um, as um, credible. 
so she suggested that the birth certificate corruption uh, might be end uh, might be ended by nid creating and digitalizing an nid database or birth certificate database which might help in this case um she lastly she recommended that the government must step up to make this holistic approaches uh, more uh, awareness building among the children and as well as the parents and she uh, specifically mentioned that monitoring and implementation of the law that already exists needs to be uh, done more uh, aggressively by the government we need uh, she also lastly she mentioned that the law has one aspect where if the parents consent to the child marriage it is not against the law and bangladesh mohila parishad is um, protesting against that law so that child marriage should be criminalized in all uh, across all fields so um, finally she ended her speech with saying that bangladesh needs to stop child marriage as soon as possible because it's a human rights violation thank you right. it's uh, it was a very accurate i think uh, translation so thank you thank you farana all right okay i think we move now to open discussion and i think uh, you know i think what uh, uh, what uh, what what shima pa you know kind of met, sort of really challenged the study in some ways in terms of uh, on the child marriage finding and i think my you know kind of uh, reflection on this is that uh, uh, so two one is you know just because covid has not increased early marriage doesn't mean early marriage doesn't remain to be a very important issue and we don't need to tie everything to you know impact of covid to make it salient uh, you know bangladesh remains to be one of the countries with the highest level of child marriage and this is a huge issue that we really need to tackle and we have been making good progress in terms of very early cohort in terms of 14 13 14 year old but still 16 onward we we still struggle and and the rates remain to be pretty uh, you know kind of not really sticky Uh, at that end and you know we really need to work on that and i think i think a lot of the work that uh, you, you know uh, uh, brad moila polishod and others have done during this covid period in some ways perhaps prevented uh, you know what could have happened as well so i think you know we don't need to get too stuck up with respect to you know this you know what what has been the effect of covid as such to draw urgent attention to this particular policy challenge and i think we need to really talk about that great uh, i think let's let's open it up uh, for some discussion some questions and you know um, and and maybe reflection from uh, experts here but also others may also want to answer so you don't only ask questions some of you may actually want to respond to some of the questions asked so please feel free to do that let's take maybe a bunch uh, maybe three uh, to begin with to open it up and then uh, we can maybe go for a second round thank you Uh, if you could just introduce yourself uh, before you make your question uh, okay. thank you very much uh, i am albert mulla executive director access bangladesh foundation uh, access bangladesh foundation we are ex working exclusively for the empowerment of people with disabilities so just i have a questions uh, to the team so before my questions uh, i would like to um, i would like to give a special thanks to the team member of this study it was an excellent job and definitely uh, government and non government actors um, will will be benefited you know highly uh, particularly in articulating the interventions uh, different planning purposes um, again thanks for the organizer um, i have a question that whether the study uh, included any adolescent Uh, with disabilities as a respondents this is one thing a uh, second thing is uh, this study is very important for many actors including government so as we are working exclusively exclusively for the people with disabilities we want to see you know the, the study is inclusive uh, meaning that when you are telling that um, responsive support mechanism we want to see um, inclusive support mechanism uh, we want to see that customized you know uh, because you know uh, particularly to get the access to justice if a 
Deb, as an adolescent, you know, she needs sign language interpreter to get access to justice. So this aspect, you know, uh, whether you consider uh, in this study purpose or not. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I think the question is very clear. Uh, maybe we'll ask Mahinapa also to respond to some of the questions. Uh, this one in particular, perhaps Mahinapa, you could, you could come back to. Uh, and also draw on not only this study. I mean, BIGD is doing lots of other studies uh, you know, in this on this theme of disability as well. So, you know, we can perhaps reflect on that as well. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you. I am Tuli Labanum Rong from Indigenous Peoples Development Services, IPDS. Uh, IPDS work for Indigenous Peoples Rights, and we are, are also partner with GIZ Rolog Log Program. So I have a uh, one recommend. Uh, you know, it is recognized that uh, the indigenous adults and girls and young are also most vulnerable. And you know, indigenous people faced serious devastating impact of COVID-19. So already Ms. Uh, Shima Muslim mentioned, uh, you know, a huge number of indigenous peoples, especially indigenous women and young girls are engaged with informal sector like uh, beauty parlor and domestic workers and ready-made garment. So I uh, recommend for in special inclusion, the adolescent and young girls from indigenous community in your uh, research work. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more, I think both of those questions I'd ask the research team to reflect on. Um, thank you very much. It's really amazing uh, research, and I just seen the community where I'm working now. I'm Monica from ActionAid Bangladesh. So ActionAid basically work for women and child development, and we are families organization. So I'm working for child development sector. So when I'm introduced about the report, it's just being where I'm working about the community. And we all know the child marriage is really very uh, alarming situation in our country, especially during this COVID situation. So I just want to know when we are uh, discussing with the adolescent group, so is there any opinion from there what they want to do to overcome the situation? Because they are saying we are really face, uh, facing the challenging situation about child marriage. But what they're thinking, how they can overcome, how they can lead their life if there is no child marriage. And also um, one issue that is very important that is the uh, poverty. But when children uh, overcome, the, uh, complete their primary school and then they started their journey in high school. So in that schooling system, if we consider there is any opportunity beside their education, to, to know how they can skill themselves to earn some money during their high school level. Because parents are really very uh, helpless and hopeless because they, they are not able to, to maintain everything of their children, especially for girl child. So I think it's very important to think when we are planning for our children to start it, any kind of activity that is uh, really uh, make them uh, dependent in income generating sector. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. I think I think that's a very very important point, and maybe maybe we can reflect on that as well. So let's just on this three. Uh, Mahinaba, do you want to say anything on on perhaps the first two, or also also the third as well? Um, just to, on, uh, let's start with disability issues. In the overall survey, um, we had a question to identify whether any of the adolescents had any kind of disability. And in fact, the numbers were very, very low. So we couldn't analyze them separately. But BIGD has carried out uh, two other separate uh, pieces of research trying to understand the impact of COVID on persons with disability. And there it was done over the telephone and Lopita maybe can add, where we did find much more information on the access to services and the difficulties in access to services, 
but it also brought out all the difficulties in carrying out research with persons with disability, issues of language, issues of trans having to go through translators, etc. So maybe um, Lopita can add. And in the on the issue of um, women from indigenous or uh, minority communities, the three districts we chose, um, Norail, Gaibantha, and Kumilla, uh, we didn't find uh, any, I mean, there weren't any pockets of, uh, you know, ethnic minorities. What we also didn't get enough was uh, religious minorities, because I'd also have liked to see if there was a difference between different religious groups, but we couldn't uh, make that. But it did, does bring out the need for having more focused research on these groups. And we realize that this is a weakness of this research that we can't say very much. Um, on the issue of the aspiration of the girls, especially um, we have, uh, as uh, Lopita, I think mentioned, the um, reduction in educational and future aspirations. Um, which came out in the surveys and the interviews. But in terms of the interviews, we also saw that the girls wanted to continue their education in spite of getting married. So they were looking for ways within the family and within the schooling system so that they could continue education. And this was also for those who had started work, who felt that maybe they needed to continue work they would like to combine work with education. So this is something that our education specialists need to think about. Um, in terms of skills, yes, there was also a feeling that they were not able to get the kind of support and training that would help them get jobs that they would find suitable, that their families would be find suitable, and also that would be relevant to their local areas. So the, the, these needs came out very strongly. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, just, just want to mention one thing. I think, you know, it's very difficult for one study to do too many things, right? And I think, I think we should also always take one study as one data point, and try and basically connect the different data points, right? I mean, so I think the importance of you know, kind of, you know, meta studies is really, really important, and I think that's that. I mean, I think there are a number of other studies I know of which which take these very specialized vulnerable groups. Uh, I, I know Center for Peace and Justice have been doing some work on that. So I think I think it'd be important not you know to also look at you know how do we actually connect connect the different studies and and sort of take some meta systematic meta studies done. I think that would be really really important to do. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll sort of never get uh, what we really. Want. I think what this study does is provide a more generalizable picture. Uh, I think that's what BIG is trying to really focus on. We really want to provide, you know, kind of rigorous, generalizable pictures. But of course, that would then, and given the resource constraint, it will miss out on special population segments. Uh, that would require to connect it with other studies. Of course, we are always happy to have huge, uh, you know, sample studies, uh, but that will require a lot of resources. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing game. Uh, great. So I think, do we have any other questions? I mean, I, I would like to reflect on a third question maybe later, but let's move to maybe a few other questions. We'll just take maybe three more, please. Hello, everyone. This is Israt Nuiri Hossein from Dalit. Uh, I'm working in Dalit in, as a monitoring officer. And uh, Dalit is working with Dalit community in Khulna, Joshur, Bagherhat, and Shatkira district. And I would like to thanks to all team members for doing this nice job and this nice presentation. And uh, I have not a question, but I have an opinion I'd like to share with you all uh, that um, from my side, I would like to request if you uh, made a video research documentary with this research based on the statements of victims, their situations, their struggles, that will be a nice work also. Uh, so, um, uh, that will be their visual representation of their struggles. So please make a video documentary if you have any further uh, research or you can add in your further research also. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll ask Lupita to respond to that, whether there's any thoughts and plans on that. Any other questions? And, and, and again, I mean, if you could think about the two themes we talked about, right? Child labor, child marriage. If you have questions that are specific to those themes, it would be really good to listen to them.
thank you to all presenters for a very clear and concise uh, uh, presentation to all of us. A uh, brief comment, actually, because we've been discussing quite a lot on whether child marriage has increased or child marriage hasn't increased and what is an alarming rate, when should we step up, etc. I think um, we are talking about an external shock the reverberations of which are still being felt, which is still very much around. And uh, the importance of doing a kind of time dip study, which is what we did almost immediately after. And then probably revisiting research with very similar questions over with the time lapse, because a lot of the effects of this will, will take time to get felt. Um, to give an example, um, what I found very interesting in, in, and it was there in one of the slides was the adolescents with time on their hands, you know, adolescents at a loose end, what kind of anxieties does that create in society, in government, and in parents in general. For females, female adolescents, it, this uh, anxiety seems to be very much around sexuality. So limiting the access to the cell phone, limiting uh, the access to outdoors, when they are not in socially controlled structures like schools, then this is a very big fear and will become over a period of time a bigger driver of early marriage. For boys, um, here is, is a slightly different anxiety, is the anxiety that they will slide into criminality. This is an anxiety that exists even in non-COVID times. But if the innovations in, 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 in addressing the gaps that are happening in adolescent lives do not step up fast enough, which they will not be able to do, I mean, nowhere in the world is that happening. If those partnerships and innovations don't step up on time, then there is a longer time lapse where education is not available and other things are not available, in which case so societal anxieties will step in more and more, and you will see an increase in child marriage, you will see an increase in unregulated employment, et cetera, et cetera. No, I think, I think that's absolutely spot on. I think, I think, I think it's really important to realize that you know what we're trying to you know look at now is more the second round effects of covid right and and the more in, and sort of second round effects are always more complex right second round effects basically you know immediate effects are clearer the, the, the causality is clearer you know the mechanisms are clearer the impacts are large at the moment you move to second round effects I think that's where you know it becomes more complex, and I think it's really important to be very thoughtful about how are we interpreting the results that we are basically getting, and and then you know really have an appetite for more of a longitudinal perspective on these things, so that we can really help uh, craft the right kind of policy, and you know uh, not policy necessarily, but you know craft the right kind of uh, uh, you know advice to the sort of policymakers. And I think I, I absolutely agree with with. The, with the, with this, with this comment. I think there are enough trajectories of vulnerability in the study which point to, I think, quite concerning uh, uh, trends that may emerge in the future. And I think that will require a follow through uh, and, and, and a kind of a monitoring approach there. Thank you very much. Uh, Lupita, do you want to uh, say anything about uh, the video? suggestion of the videography. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yes. Um, pictures say much more than words ever can, and they give the message much more directly. Um, I was just thinking, when you were saying that, I was thinking about uh, participatory video um, um, projects that we've done before, where we, if we go and do a video, it will be very different from what, uh, if we give the camera and the skills to adolescents, they might do a much, much better job, a more, you know, sort of honest job of it. So, yeah, resources, we'll do it. <laughs> uh, and I just want to add to uh, Prometheus and Gupta's observations. Um, one of the images that really scared uh, parents um, was the image of these 15, 16 year old girls, dangor, dangor, like girls who are sort of blossoming into womanhood, just hanging about, um, you know, the house or in the grounds because they're either usually in school or at home. And, and here they were sort of like lounging around and, and it really, really scared them. And this is one image that they kept on coming up with as a reason for getting them married. Um, so yeah, 
So that just wanted to add that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think let's move on. Let's move on to the the two other topics that we want to hear from our uh, panelists here. So the first one, I think uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Uh, Mahmoudullah has decided he's going to speak in Bangla as well, the additional director, Social Safety Net Wing, Department of Social Services. So we want to hear from him about COVID and children in conflict with the law. Um, and I think you know one overriding, uh, I think, image for me uh, from the presentation that I just want to, again, you know, get everybody to pay attention to a bit is the difference between boys and girls when they were asked about uh, whether they think, uh, 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 you, you know, kind of uh, uh, harassment that has happened to them as, uh, as, 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 a, as, a, as a crime or as a, as a opera, as unacceptable, how unacceptable, uh, you know, the kind of events that happened to them in the house and outside the house between boys and girls and what we see very clearly, it's of course, one would expect that, you know, both boys and girls are saying, yes, outside the house, they basically feel those to be more of a problem than same events happening inside the house. But what you see is still, you know, over 50% of girls still do not think that those events that happen to them outside the, outside the house, you know, is a crime. And I think that internalization of norm remains to be the first principle, first barrier that we really need to address if we're going to really get into any type of, you know, legal uh, access to justice happening. So I, I hope we're going to be talking about that. So, uh, Mr. Maudro, over to you. सम्मानित सर मंच पैनलिस्टवृंद सम्मानित उपस्थिति विशेष भाव धन्यवाद असंख्य धन्यवाद शिशु जिल जैसे आलोचना कारण शिशुराव 
सुप्रीम कोर्ट शिशुर विषय कर चालू हलो समय लकडाउन चरम अवस्था चलते चालू हलो लकडाउन भरे तेजे मानसिक चाप एवं लकडाउन चलते से अवस्थाओ विभिन्न क्राइम सम्पृक्त हो जाए शिशु उन्नयन केंद्र गुली आसलो फिर गल तो रिसार्चर जैगा मंत्रालय मंत्रालय पुलिस हेडकोर्टर समाज कल्याण मंत्रालय समाज दफ्तर एज ए हल कम्प्रिहेंसिव एक ग्रहण शिशु विषय गुली भारनाबिलिटी भारनाबिलिटी कमानो जाए भाव्रेस फिल्ड लेवल पक्ष सरकार ग्रहण कर नहीं लकडाउन नहीं सरकार बंदेक्टन सरकार मृत्युहारमिए रखते सक्षम हो 
সুতরাং প্রোটেকটিভ মেজার্স গুলি সেটা আমরা গ্রহণ করেছি এবং আমরা ফলাফল পেয়েছি ইনিশিয়েটিভ বা মেজার্স যেগুলি আমরা নিয়েছি এটার মধ্যে সরকার যে সেই সময়ে সোশ্যাল সেফটি নেটের যে পদ্ধতিগুলি বা যে ইনিশিয়েটিভগুলি গ্রহণ করেছিল যেরকম খাদ্য সহায়তা নগদ সহায়তা এই বিষয়গুলিও তখন আমরা দেখেছি এবং সেই বিষয়গুলি ওই সমস্ত হাউস হোল্ড যে সমস্ত হাউস হোল্ডে অ্যাডলসেন্ট অবস্থান করছে এটা নিহায় ইনডিরেক্টলি আর ডিরেক্টলি তাদেরকেও কিন্তু সাপোর্ট করেছে এবং তারাও কিন্তু প্রোটেকটিভ ওয়েতে কিছুটা হলেও অবস্থান করতে পেরেছে যেটা ইয়া বলেছেন সীমা দিদি যে ডিজিটাল বার্থ রেজিস্ট্রেন্স রেজিস্ট্রেশন সিস্টেম বা এনআইডি সিস্টেম এবং এই বিষয়গুলি কিন্তু বাংলাদেশ সরকারের বা আমরা সবাই জানি আমরা সবাই এটার সুবিধা ভোগ করছি যে ইতিমধ্যে বার্থ রেজিস্ট্রেশন সিস্টেমটা ডিজিটালাইজ হয়েছে এবং এখন কিন্তু আমরা স্কুল কলেজে যারা পড়ছে আফটার প্যান্ডামিক এখন স্কুল যখন খুলেছে স্কুল কিন্তু এখন তাদের রেজিস্ট্রেশনের জন্য এই ডিজিটাল বাত রেজিস্ট্রেশন ছাড়া কিন্তু আর কোন অবস্থাতেই ম্যানুয়াল বাত রেজিস্ট্রেশন গ্রহণ করছে না সুতরাং এইটা এবং এইটার সাথে আরো অনেক ডিজিটাল এমন এমন ডেটাবেস সিস্টেম বাংলাদেশ সরকারের পক্ষ থেকে ইভেন আমাদের দেশের আইএনজিও এনজিও অন্য অন্য সংগঠনের পক্ষ থেকেও এরকম ডিজিটাল সিস্টেম বাংলাদেশে এস্টাবলিশ হচ্ছে যেগুলির ফলাফল আমরা সবাই ভোগ করছি আর সব বিশেষ করে আমরা কোভিড সিচুয়েশনের সময় যেটা সরকারের নির্দেশনায় গত অর্থ বছর থেকে শুরু হয়েছে সেটা হলো সোশ্যাল সেফটি নেট যে প্রোগ্রাম অ্যাজ এ হোল সরকারের অনেকগুলি মিনিস্ট্রি সোশ্যাল সেফটি নেট প্রোগ্রামের সাথে সম্পৃক্ত এবং টোটাল সোশ্যাল সেফটি নেটের মধ্যে যত নগদ সহায়তা আছে সকল নগদ সহায়তা এখন জি টু পি পদ্ধতিতে ডিজিটালি মোবাইল ফাইন্যান্সিয়ালের মাধ্যমে মানে ইয়াদের বেনিফিশিয়ারির কাছে পৌঁছাচ্ছে সুতরাং রিসার্চারদের জন্য বা রিসার্চের ফলাফলটার বিষয়ে এভাবে ধন্যবাদ দিতে চাই যে ইয়েস আপনি রাইটলি মেনশন করেছেন যে একটা রিসার্চ দিয়েই আমরা টোটাল চিত্রটাকে যে তুলে আনতে পারবো সেরকম তো না তবে এরকম সেগমেন্ট সেগমেন্ট রিসার্চ যখন হবে এবং সেইটা যখন সরকারকে অ্যাড্রেস করবে সরকারের পক্ষে আজ হল আমাদের সবার জন্য সেটা সুবিধাজনক অবস্থা এই যে আমরা বা সরকার সঠিক পদক্ষেপটা সঠিক সময়ে নিতে সক্ষম হবে তো সবচেয়ে শেষে আবারও যারা আয়োজন করেছেন আয়োজক সংস্থা এবং যারা রিসার্চার ছিলেন রিসার্চ সংগঠনের সাথে বা এই রিসার্চার সাথে জড়িত ছিলেন তাদের সবাইকে আবার আবার অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ জানিয়ে বক্তব্য শেষ করছি সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ আল্লাহ হাফেজ Hi, this is Shoaiba from ZIZ. Uh, just uh, the, uh, focusing on the key issues that Sajj just mentioned, that um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, this kind of research is a so remarkable word, but the scenario of child and adolescent conflict with law, uh, he requested to, uh, to, he requested to meet with those uh, who left during the COVID, uh, the uh, child development center. And also uh, he said that uh, uh, the crime was uh, increasing due to lockdown. And at that moment, uh, the virtual uh, court law was introduced and from uh, uh, 12 April 2021 to 30, uh, uh, 3, 7, 2021, 1,003 children were uh, reintegrated from the Child Development Center. And also uh, some ad uh, 82 adolescent girls were there and they uh, got released from at that moment. Can you just summarize, you know, very short. Okay, so uh, he want, uh, he just tell us to uh, uh, include in uh, them also this kind of, include these uh, uh, adolescent girls in this research that uh, it will helpful to understand the actual scenario and also, uh, Okay, and then 
Uh, he mentioned about the toll-free helpline uh, during COVID period it was functioning and the protection measures has been taken by the government also. Uh, though the schools were closed, but some measures were there, but uh, and they successfully protected them from the COVID, that period. That should be included in this uh, research. And also some social safety net program was there about food and cash providing. Uh, that also important. Uh, that was also helpful, and also we can include uh, the thing in uh, in, uh, in this research and all, uh, this kind of thing. And also uh, he mentioned about the digital birth registration that already introduced, and uh, some other database also established. So uh, it's working, and uh, that's the thing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, my biggest takeaway from uh, from 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 what Mr. Mahmudullah said for for the research is that I think for the to really get to really understand this conflict with law domain, I think we possibly should have thought about different type of sampling. I think the sampling that was done, you cannot do a population based sampling on this. I think it was sampling for this should have been a different type of sampling. Uh, perhaps institutional, we should have taken institutional data and then use that to really follow up. If you really wanted to really elaborate, unpack, you know, COVID and this conflict with law issues. So I think that's a, a real uh, suggestion. I think for next time, we'll definitely think about this more carefully. I think the domain specific sampling is always something that we should always think about. Great, uh, let's move to the, uh, to the, to the last uh, but not least. Uh, I think this is really the underlying, uh, uh, I think domain of, of, of concern, which is education loss and recovery. So Dr. Shofikul Islam, former director, education, BRAC, uh, uh, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start. There is still a debate among the health specialists whether COVID was pandemic or not, because there are very specific criteria associated for pandemic and non-pandemic. But for certainly I can tell you, for education, it was a pandemic. And particularly in a few countries, one of the other Bangladesh. And the reason I am bringing it, because pandemic has a consequence which naturally requires a bit of longer term planning, very strict monitoring, so that you learn in every south phases and adjust, and finally try to achieve what we plan to achieve. So that was the key point I wanted to make, that why this I call it a pandemic. Now, on the whole issue of learning loss, one of the key issues that we are talking during the pandemic. Now, the narratives of learning loss is fundamentally important. And to the best of my understanding, we do not have a country level, regional level, or a global level common consensus about the narratives of learning loss. And of course, there are obvious reasons associated with it. The solution more should be at the country level, but there can be lessons that would be relevant for the global community. And my still core understanding is we are struggling in Bangladesh to bring the narratives. Because this learning loss narrative is more of a political agenda than just a learning agenda. So it would be connecting a lot more dots than one can just imagine. <laughs> to simplify the matter and limiting it to our today's discussion, particularly the adolescent group. So I'd be 
consciously avoiding the primary education children, although some of them are pretty much adolescent, and mostly being at the secondary level, who are more on that question. One thing is for sure that whether it is boys or girls, all suffer serious losses. And the losses were much higher among the marginal populations than others. And as we have seen in the study, and as it was pointed out by Shimbadi Shimapa from the Mokhila Polisha, women in our society, and Lucent in particular, I have come across an age which is called adolescent. And I still remember how my views were created in the society. Because you are just adolescent, you are not fully matured, so you better not to bring an explanation, you better follow what we say. So these are the typical cultural politics that we occupy. And not a sea of change has taken place in Bangladesh for that matter. So the girls remain a serious development for that. And the curve that was showing the access to mobile, despite girls needed it more than boys for the learning, neither the state came forward, nor there was any initiative They at least borrow the phone to the girls for four hours so that they can attend the learning. So we just took it granted that giving a cell phone to a girl, smartphone to a girl, would not be used for learning. So the perception is not the girl's perception. It's my perception, the way I would like to approach it. And that is one of the deep problems of the society. How do we address it in the coming days? Remains another thing. Now coming back to the learning loss, the whole narrative issue. One is the loss that incurred during COVID. And typically most people think this is the learning loss, but it is not. There were learning deficit. I, just to make different, I use the term deficit before the COVID. So what happened? The deficit plus the COVID loss created altogether a new situation. The situation is worse for the marginal population, except for a few. Even those who avail the private tutor, more fortunate group, it is still a loss. So it would be depending on the narratives that how we see the scale. Just to give an example, now classes are resumed in Bangladesh taking place. Now think of in this month, what is happening in the Northeast of Bangladesh, the Silent. Due to flash floods, all the schools are inundated, all are closed, there is no class. So it's not a, it's a disruption, but think of from a child view. So how, where do we account it for? <clears throat> and this is nothing new in, in the whole education cycle. So if you take a child in the high school or in the primary school, how many times it occurs in their life? And despite being a, uh, very naturally challenged country, Bangladesh. And in the education sector, we do not have a narrative, even for those learning losses. Let alone forget how to be the, the addressing point. So we just take it granted till there was a flash flood, the schools are closed, and then the school will be reopened, life goes on. And that's the problem. The whole mindset problem, how do we address that? 
and thanks to this research, the 62% that Lopa was pointing out on that graph, that the children do not want to go back to school. Why? Because it's not an excited exercise for them. Because it's not something that do not want. It's not like that. They pretty much want it. But they know how that is a very challenging situation. They would not be able to address that. Hmm. So there is a governance situation associated with it. It's a national. At the same time, it's pretty much local. And this local issue is fundamentally important. How do you really devolve the authority to the local people, the Upojala district, so that they can handle it on their own? Um, the, um, in the report, it was in very good detail, and I really liked it, uh, the whole tech work issue because it's the AO forward. And what I would like to really underline, stack work particularly for the girls will not work at the desired level unless the policy makers, the providers change their approaches. It's not that how many girls participate in a tech work. It should be how the tech work Education goes to the girls. So it has to be other way around. So if you expert that we have opened an institute and girls should be coming, getting enrolled and attending X number of days, residential, non-residential, and so on, it may work to, the, to some extent for the boys, but not for the girls. So it has to be that how the tech book would really go to the girls if we really want to see change is happening. Otherwise, it will be a very slow moving thing. I'll finish in two minutes. Internet use. In the post pandemic, who would be able to afford the cost of the internet? Because there is no special rate for the students. So this is a very simple thing that there should be something, a special rate for the learning purposes. And finally, on one point, my personal view, if I look back now, yet the pandemic is not over, the Bangladesh is graduating from LDC. The one thing, just borrowing the uh, title from Goldsmith, who said, what got you here would not go to you there. If we do not take it seriously, the post pandemic will just forget and bring it as a normal way of life. Now, coming from the adolescent, Imran by his notes, many of you know, adolescent is a fundamentally important population for a country like Bangladesh. So, I wonder whether Bangladesh needs a Adolescent Development Index to develop, which would be then tracking whether the adolescent development is really taking place. It has to be a composite activity. And I hope that BIGD can be one which can take the lead. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Definitely discuss further on your challenge, but but you know I, I mean I think for sake of time we'll not go for Q and A. We'll just go straight to you know our uh, special guests uh, talking. But I just want to draw one thing that Shofi Bai said, and I think it's really important. I mean, there's a whole uh, uh, there's, a, there's a whole uh, you know you know in the humanitarian literature there's a whole thing around education and emergency and education emergency is increasingly getting a lot more attention and focus and and so i sort of wonder you know i mean in the in the bangladesh context i mean uh, both for covid and also for natural disaster education in emergency hasn't really become mainstream 
And I think it's really important to, to really, you know, kind of think about education planning as if we are constantly in different types of emergencies, because that's exactly what Bangladesh is. I mean, we have all types of natural disasters and other types of emergencies happening, cyclones happening. How do we continue education in a in a in a in an emergency context? And localization is going to be critical to that. Uh, you know, uh, local government is going to be critical critical to that. And I think that's a really important agenda to really think about. And you know, hopefully, we can uh, have some uh, uh, you know uh, wider conversation on that later. Great. Uh, I, I would I would now like to request. To we have we have got three special guests, and then we also have another special guest, four special guests actually. So, uh, and we have about fifteen minutes, but let's say we have about 20, 20 minutes, twenty five minutes. We'll try and finish by then. Uh, let me let me request, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, I think we are we are changing. Yes, yes. Let's uh, let's have change of guards here. So, uh, yeah. Why don't you invite uh, the people who are supposed to be here? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mathin, respected panelists and the audience for an insightful and engaging discussion. Now, I would like to invite our special guest, Madam Umme Kulsum, Joint Secretary of Union, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs, and National Project Director, GIZ Project. Uh, I would also like to request uh, Mr. Javed Patel, Deputy High Commissioner, British High Commission, Dhaka, Ms. Karen Bloom, Deputy Head of Development Corporation, German Embassy, and Dr. Angelika Flederman, Country Director, GIZ Bangladesh, to join us on stage. Thank you. I would now like to request Dr. Angelika Flederman, Country Director, GIZ Bangladesh, to give her speech. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to all participants here. I'm very happy again to see Mrs. Umay Kulsum, Joint Secretary from the Ministry of Law, Justice, and Parliamentary Affairs, Mr. Javed Patel. Uh, from the High Commissioner, uh, High British High Commission, and uh, Karin Blume, and of course, Dr. Martin, very happy to see and also was listening your moderation here at the panel. Thank you so much. And actually, uh, thank you also to the organizers and to uh, the BRAC um, Institute of Governance and Development to invite me here and to listen to this research. Actually, um, it was for me also very interesting and not only the research, we discussed already beforehand, I had um, read a bit in the evening yesterday, but also to listen to the panelists here now because I think they gave much more to the research. It was very well taken also with the different ideas. I mean, on the different aspects, actually child labor, very important, very difficult to tackle it actually here in Bangladesh. We early marriage, we hear again and again, and uh, yes, it will continue. We also know it had maybe COVID didn't have such a big impact, but it is there, as somebody also there is said, actually. Then also very interesting was for me, um, because um, going through the COVID time here and the school are closed, I mean, what does it mean to the children? I couldn't imagine. So it was very interesting also to, to, uh, to listen uh, to the gentleman uh, from back actually on this learning loss. I mean, and how actually to, what does it mean? How to assess this? What does it mean to the, to the new generation? And the last not least also violence. I mean, we know violence and also getting conflict with the, for young people with the, uh, with the law is, is a tremendous impact also on their lives. So I have a speech here for, you know, going around again, also your research. I think everything was said and also nicely from uh, you and your the team here is nicely uh, said actually and also presented. And it, as I said, the panelists made a good 
the good uh, flavor around that, I would say. So um, for me, and, and I really appreciate very much this re research and also specifically this adolescence research because it, uh, it has to play a role in shaping the future as over. That is what the message I got, 32 million are young people and that is 25% of Bangladesh uh, population belong to that group. So this means that the future of Bangladesh lies in, the ha in this hands at the moment, you know, because growing up, they are the adults in future. So with what, what is their package actually, if we listen on, on what we heard here today. And uh, that's why also um, it came also here and there, taking these timely decisions and making the right choices for girls and boys will determine the future of their lives and the future also of Bangladesh. I'm very much in line with that. And finally, it's all, all our responsibilities here. Actually, uh, Dr. Martins Water also was the one saying, we shouldn't look not at the present at the research only, but in the future. The question now, and that is, it came here and there, we should, we could, we must do, but what? What do we do actually? That is the, um, I was about already to raise my hand to ask that question, but I thought I'm, I'm anywhere the year. <laughs> I know, as a special guest, I can say, ask also that question. I mean, here they are, uh, we have the government, we have uh, the NGOs, but what is actually the action now to do? I mean, in order to help though, uh, the adolescents, yeah, uh, boys and girls, that they can shape the future of Bangladesh. Actually, that is the question to me. And um, that that is always with research. I'm not from this field, you know, uh, more in a, a natural science, but also there are a lot of research is happening. What, how do we transfer it in, into doing? And that is actually still my question here. And I'm sure Brock and also all I hear will work on that, but I think that is very important. For my last point, thank you everybody here. Um, Brack, actually for specifically also the Institute of Governments and Governance and Development to implement that. The funding came from Germany. Thank you very much, of course, for, for the German government, Bangladesh also for the, is, um, the Ministry of Law and all others also here for taking part in this session. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fletterman. Uh, I would now like to request Ms. Karen Bloom, Deputy Head of Development Corporation, German Embassy, to give her speech. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And Mrs. Ume Kusum, <laughs> nice to see you here also on the panel. Mr. Javed Patel, um, my colleague, uh, Angelika. Romita, uh, Imran, ladies and gentlemen, panelists, I guess, thank you very much for inviting me to this event today. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, especially as uh, Germany and Bangladesh are also celebrating 50 years of cooperation. And I think um, this, this research actually really fits well in our cooperation and I'm really proud when I look at our cooperation where, where we have arrived at that state now that we do this kind of research, which is, I think is really significant. Um, this research for me actually comes really to the, to the core of what development cooperation today is, because in the end, what do we want when we talk about development? We want to actually enable each and every one to, to have the opportunity to take choices. We heard a lot about to take choices, to be able to really live their life to their full potential. And that is development. So what happened now? This research also focused on what happened to the choices girls, boys, young people in Bangladesh can make. So they have been limited in, in the possibilities. What can they choose actually? And of course, um, yeah, I think there were so many informations today 
on uh, on their results. Uh, and so it's such a complex situation. Let me just also pick some few. And I think um, the school closure is, of course, the, the biggest impacting factor here, I think, um, where everything else comes kind of as a consequence. I was really also surprised to hear that it's not only then a child labor as a consequence to supplement the income of the people, but that it is also regarding the, uh, the risk of reputation and security. And you were mentioning in a slightly different context, but we have to break up this internalization of, of norms. And I think this is also connected to that. Well, if we want to went, want to provide every young, young people here all the young people in Bangladesh with their choices, we have to break up norms also to, to give them all the same possibilities. And so um, another important factor I learned from this study is really also the mental health factor. Um, and I think there is a lot of scope what can be done to support young people. How do you deal with that actually? With the situation, schools closed, yeah girls uh, locked in home or really kept indoors, uh, boys sent to work, but then also specifically for, for girls, if they have no more aspirations in life and what does it mean for their mental health, actually, how do they cope with this situation? Um, one of the panelists or, or speakers before mentioned also, they were then also deprived from all their social life, interacting and, and everything that you need for your emotional health and well-being. So how, how do these people deal with it? And what does it mean from choices they make after? Um, and several people mentioned, so, so what do we do now? Well, I think the most important questions are, of course, then how do we bring back boys and girls to school? What kind of support do young people, adolescents need um, who want to continue with their education? Um, but also what alternatives are there for, for young people? We saw also a lot don't even want to go back to education now. So what can we do for them? And how can we still enable them to, to make choices that, that add to really um, a good, good life choices? Let me just put it simply like this. So, but then also in terms of mental well-being, what can we do? Um, yeah. Priority, bringing uh, kids back to school, but as we saw, everything is very complex. So what can we do in all the different other areas? And then also having in mind uh, that I think the stress that boys and girls go through is very different for boys and girls. So we also need to differentiate that when we look at uh, actions we want to take and what we can take. And uh, yeah, I think... There's a lot to do um, for, for longer term recovery. It means maybe a more comprehensive approach. And I think we have that. There's still a lot of hope for um, non-governmental actors and government to act together. I think this needs a hand-in-hand -hand work. And uh, I'm really grateful, and maybe I just stop here, that we have the Ministry of Law, Justice, and Parliamentary Affairs uh, present here. Um, thank you. Thank you for supporting this event. Thank you, um, BIGD, Martin, for, for hosting, and GIZ and BIGD for organizing this event. And thanks to the audience for participating today and listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Uh, I would now like to request Mr. Javed Patel, Deputy High Commissioner, British High Commission, Dhaka, to give his speech. Thank you. Uh, respected Joint Secretary, colleagues, panelists uh, and participants, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I won't name everyone uh, for the sake of time. Uh, it's always difficult when you're asked to speak just before lunch because I know some people are eager to get out there. So uh, I have a full speech, but what I might do is just offer some very brief remarks. Um, uh, what I plan to do is sort of talk a lot about the data that's been repeated by a number of uh, speakers. Um, and so what... Uh, what I might sort of conclude with is just some questions as our, our first speaker did. Um, I mean, before I do that, I just want to say how proud uh, the British High Commission is and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office is in supporting this piece of research, working in partnership um, with um, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development 
Um, and a, a big thank you to all the researchers uh, and the organizations involved in pulling it together as well as um, this, this event. I think it's really important that once, re when research of this nature is conducted, there are opportunities to share in this forum. And I reflected when I arrived earlier uh, that it's really refreshing after sort of two years of not being able to uh, speak at events like this, that it's great to meet people in person uh, because there's only so much you can achieve by doing this online. And actually that's relevant to what we talked about. Um, if we struggle uh, as adults, as, as professionals, um, I can only imagine the challenges um, faced by, by ch children and some of the participants who were involved in the research. Um, I'm a father of two teenage children uh, and having sort of navigated the COVID pandemic and seeing some of the challenges they went through, uh, a lot of um, what I heard today felt very relevant and resonated. Um, but again, uh, you know, my children don't face the sorts of challenges that we've, we've discussed today. Um, and I think that really, really brought home how, how difficult an issue this is. So the, the question this leads me with is, so what? Um, you know, I, I, I read lots of really interesting research. I see lots of uh, really important data points, um, but I'm always left with the, okay, so what do we do about it? Uh, and I think the speaker in the last uh, session um, sort of aptly said that um, actually a lot of this isn't new. What it's done is it's been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's not issues that weren't familiar to Bangladesh um, pre-COVID. Uh, this has been um, sort of a long systemic issue in this country for which Bangladesh has made significant progress. Um, so is this a setback? Uh, someone also mentioned that actually there are concurrent crises in countries like Bangladesh. So um, you know, we shouldn't look at COVID in isolation, that this happened, okay, now we're over it. So, you know, we, we can look forward to a brighter future where things will improve. Um, it's how do you remain sort of resilient to that? So, so what action do we take as a result of this? What action does Bangladesh take uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we don't have these sort of cycles of improvement in education attainment and then um, sharp cliff edges where, where suddenly uh, children find that you know, the progress that's been made in previous decades is lost. Um, and I think the key question in this is, how do those actions build res resilience uh, to shocks? Um, you know, what, what measures do you need? I think um, uh, Dr. Imran mentioned earlier, um, you know, thinking about the governance structures um, and having the arrangements in place. So I've got a background in sort of crisis response. Uh, and, uh, and we think a lot about sort of structures and making sure that it doesn't matter what crisis you face, that you've thought about the potential implications of all of that and you're prepared for it and you're ready to act on it uh, when they happen. Um, and then the other critical part of this is culture and mindset, uh, which I think a couple of panel members mentioned, which is how do you change the perception um, and the mindsets of parents um, and, and, and prevent them from taking the sorts of actions or to you know, take a leap of faith or make presumptions about what their children might get up to um, in the face of these sorts of shock. Now that is really, really difficult. I don't underestimate the challenge uh, of all of that. And every community in every country has those sorts of challenges. Uh, but I think that is a, that is a pretty big one. Um, lastly, I wanna just talk very briefly about the UK's international development strategy, which was launched uh, only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the, the spread and depth of the issues that um, this re research touched on very much um, resonates with, uh, with the priorities that are set out in our international development strategy, particularly those around um, supporting girls, uh, women and gender equality. Um, and I might just sort of end with um, a, a quote from our foreign secretary, Liz Truss, uh, who said that supporting women and girls is at the heart of UK foreign policy. And we want women to have agency over their own lives and to be free to succeed. Uh, and I think that goes to the heart of what we're trying to do here. Uh, yes, we've talked about adolescent boys, uh, but we recognise that the challenges for women and girls um, far exceed those of boys because of the culture, because of the systematic issues um, in, in Bangladesh. Um, and the UK government sort of supports Bangladesh in its endeavours to support women and girls to make progress. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patel. I would now like to request Madam Ume Kulsum, Joint Secretary of Opinion, Law and Justice Division, Ministry of Law, Justice and Parliamentary Affairs and National Project Director, GIZ Bangladesh, to give her speech. So I am following 
David Patel, Mr. David Patel, and I am not addressing each and everybody with his name. So, uh, as because I know, I believe that everybody is hungry. <laughs> so, yeah, I will not take uh, enough time. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Special Guests, all of the special guests and the moderator uh, and the executive director, Breaku Institute of Governance and Development, panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. I am very happy to attend the dissemination event of this research findings on adolescent girls, vulnerability and transitions in the context of COVID-19. Actually, I am very much delighted and enriched from hearing all of you, especially from the discussions. And the research was conducted uh, on the basis of the subject matter, which is related with adolescent period. And all of you know that adolescent period is very important period of each and every body's life. That's because it is related with our physical, mental, and social psychological growth. And we all know that Bangladesh is the second largest uh, country on the basis of the number of the adolescent adolescents. So it is very timely approach to conduct a research on point of these issues. We all know that after living two years with COVID-19, we are now approaching the post-COVID period. We need a comprehensive information to set strategies to deal with the post-COVID situation. For example, if we want to act for women and children's well-being, we need to understand how their time was during pandemic and what challenges they faced. As a focal point of SDGs from our ministry, I want to share something with you. We all know that government has taken some effective step to identify the major area of challenges, which are the direct impact of COVID-19 pandemic in SDGs implementation. And the main focused areas of challenges are poverty, gender, health, education, inequality, and access to justice. And all these points are related to the adolescent child. We also know that SDG 5 is closely related with the achievement of SDG 1 and 16. To end poverty, we have to ensure social protection and strong institution. To ensure social protection, access to justice is an essential indicator. Law and Justice Division is working to promote equal access to justice by providing legal aid and legal consultation with the cooperation of its development partners and domestic NGOs. Our Honorable Secretary, as the Chief Guest of this event, already mentioned briefly in his speech the number of justice seekers in COVID period and the number of granting bail uh, by uh, providing uh, uh, by providing uh, access, by providing access to justice and uh, and online court service. So I don't want to repeat it again. I want to mention one thing about the discussion point of Shima Muslim, which is related with uh, birth registration. It is very important key factor for prote for protecting uh, child marriage. And already uh, our colleague of Social Protection Department additional director has rightly mentioned that digital birth registration system already have been introduced and now we are uh, taking the good effects of this system. We all know that the government has clearly identified the COVID-19 recovery strategy and gender equality and women empowerment framework in its eighth five-year plan. After hearing from the research team on the key findings, panelists and the discussant, I am well convinced that the gender equality and the women empowerment framework should become an integral part of the COVID recovery strategy. This will help to better respond to the issue raised in the study relating to women and girls. I am pleased to note that the overall findings of the study address the theme of the SDG 5 and 16, which is on achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, and to promote peaceful and inclusive society for sustainable development, 
provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions to all levels respectively. Bangladesh government has undertaken many short-term and long-term steps to deal with the aftermath of COVID-19, which strongly resonates with many of the recommendations made in the policy brief. I believe that the recommendations highlighted in the policy brief will help, help to guide us to develop appropriate strategies that will bring greater benefit to women and adolescents. I would like to thank Bragg Institutes of Govern Governance and Development for conducting this insightful research and thank GIZ's Rule of Law Program for the timely commissioning of the study. As the National Project Director, I want to thank the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for their continued sub-partnership with the Government of Bangladesh. Thank you. Thanks for, for your patience, Harry. Thanks to all. Thank you, Madam Gulson. Uh, to close the event, I would now like to invite Dr. Imran Mateen to share the closing remarks and deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know I'm standing between lunch and all of you. Um, so first of all, I, I think this has been really good discussion. Uh, I mean, I have taken lots of notes. So thank you all very much. Thank you for all the panelists and all of you. I think you, you really brought out some really, I think, uh, 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 summarized distilled reflection, which I think would help us. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, raise, uh, by conclude with three three thoughts. Or you know, so so first is I think there was a question about you know so what do we do next? So I was thinking about it, and we will think about it more. But I think there are three kind of core areas. So I think one is how do we bring? I think this is what Shofik Bhai talked about. How do we really bring learning at the center of schools? And I think we really have an opportunity here, and we really need to kind of center ourselves in terms of a learning-oriented school. I think school is really important because I think school as a socialization platform is independently important, but learning is the way we can actually get children in school and actually benefit from it. So I think learning, getting learning at the center of school is going to be a very important agenda that I think is emerging. We need to work on, we need to think creatively. Second is skills. I think there are, uh, you know, there will be, we have to think about skills creatively now and also link skills with education as well. We have an opportunity here, you know, where we have a more part-time, uh, you know, you know, people going, children going, by, adolescents going back to part-time work. How do we weave things there uh, uh, to, because unless we can continue education a bit, skill itself also cannot be, we cannot really leverage the impact of skills as well. So I think the continuation of education and new skills are actually quite complementary. And I know, you know, you know, Germany has got great models in terms of uh, in terms of apprenticeship based model and BRAC has been really working on those as well. So I think we need to really be thinking creatively about uh, these type of models for the future, for the new sectors, green economy, green skills, uh, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the digital opportunities. Um, and the third is we have to think much more seriously about safety safety and security and i think that becomes very very you know it became very clear so i think those three three s schools skills and safety security would be my three you know kind of pillars and cross-cutting i think we need to be thinking about uh systems so we need to be thinking how do we approach that in a more systematic way and we need to think about norms because i think norms always you know we don't think much about it but i think if you really want to change all these three, we need to think about norms far more seriously. So that would be my immediate framework in my head in terms of a call for action, and we can sharpen that further. Uh, I, I, I also want to basically say that for, 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 for us to move forward, we need to, be, we need to be thinking about what works far more rigorously. And I think we need to, you know, that basically means we need to be thinking sharply about more experimental uh, approaches to research and to figure out what actually works, but to generate the hypothesis in terms of what could work, we need to have much more of a multidisciplinary and multi-actor oriented conversations to generate those ideas of what could work and then test those out very rigorously. And I think that is the kind of agenda that we really need to invest in. 
Finally, I would like to you know, invite all of you, not, I mean, not only to lunch, but, but on, uh, from June 20th, 21st and 22nd, BIGD is organizing an international conference on digitalization and the new frontiers of service delivery. A lot of the things we discussed today have got digitalization very much as a part of it. And this remains to be a very important opportunity for us. So I think uh, I would really like to invite you to please attend that. Uh, conference which will be happening here as, as well. So with, with that, thank you all very much. And let's move to lunch. Yeah, we would like to invite you to join us for lunch. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 